So I would like to welcome you to the Irish Aviation Students Association's 6th Annual Aviation Symposium, streaming live from the IA headquarters here in Dublin. We would like to extend a warm welcome to all those tuning in across Ireland, around the globe, and especially to our guest speakers and sponsors, without whose support today would not be possible. Firstly, I would like to introduce myself and give a brief background into IASA and our mission. My name is Matthew Gordon, I'm a student at DCU, and I'm lucky enough to be the current chairperson of the Irish Aviation Students Association. Today, I will deviate slightly from my usual roles to be your Master of Ceremonies for this wonderful event. For anyone who is new to IASA, IASA was founded in 2015 with the goal of connecting students to the industry and empowering the next generation of aviation professionals. IASA has upheld these principles ever since through networking events, student outreach, and career slingshots, just to name a few. IASA has always wanted to help, inspire, and sh showcase opportunities in both third level and beyond within Ireland, the UK, and further afield that students may not have been aware of. IASA is run by a voluntary team of dedicated students who are passionate students just like yourself. Aviation in Ireland is a thriving and welcoming industry. You could even say it's in our blood. It is unique in how many professionals within the industry are willing to support and encourage students when starting out and as they embark on their path within aviation. It is incredibly motivating to see so many industry professionals from the vast amount of backgrounds within aviation actively participating in IASA events such as today's symposium. Aviation is not a one size fits all when it comes to specialty. It's such a vast industry that covers roles from pilots, air traffic controllers, aviation finance, airport operations, and airline operations. The list could go on and on. But within each of these categories, we can see, an, again, a vast majority of specialties. The reason I mention this is that aviation is an industry where there's a role for everyone and anyone who is passionate. Although the industry has been severely affected over the last two years, the theme of this year's symposium is a positive one, recovering and innovating aviation. You've probably seen the recent increase in aircraft in the sky, or seen the queues of people lining up to go on their holidays after two years. You might have even been one of them. But what you may have not have seen is just how innovating the industry can be, has been, and will be over the coming years. Today, you'll be able to find out from the top people from all aspects of aviation on how they and their organizations remain resilient through such uncertain times, and how they can re remain resilient no matter what comes their way in the future. I would just like to take this opportunity to thank our sponsors who the last two years of uncertainty have continued their in incredible support of our organization and mission. Our signature sponsors, DAE Capital, SMBC Aviation Capital, the ISAT Foundation, Killick Aerospace, PwC, KPMG, EY, are supported by sponsors, CAE, Six West, and our host for today, the Irish Aviation Authority. Our partners, Airbus, ITT, Airline Pilot Club, the European Aviation Wellness Committee, Simtech, Alphatech, and the National Flight Centre. And finally, our university partners, DCU, MTU, and UCD Smurfit. I do also have to thank video, the Video Works team who have made it possible for me to appear on your screen right now. And speaking of me being on your screen, you can probably tell from my face that we are very excited about our incredible lineup today and being able to share it with you. Not alone that, there will also be a number of spot prizes to be won throughout the day including Simtech Aviation Vouchers, Alphatech Airbus A320 Experience Vouchers, and National Flight Centre Vouchers. 
But before we get into it, I'll give you a quick rundown of the flow of today's event. We'll have a mixture of presentations, interviews, and panel discussions throughout the day, with a few people joining us in the IAA headquarters and the rest streaming from their current location across the globe. In order to keep the day kicking on, there will unfortunately not be any Q&A uh, interaction between our guest and you, our guest speakers, and you, the audience. But we know that any questions you might have had before their topics or discussions will be answered today. So, I would like to invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. Kicking off our symposium, we are delighted to be joined by Enda Cornell, who is the country manager for Emirates. With over 30 years experience and knowledge within the industry, today Enda will be discussing Emirates emergence from the pandemic and their future. It is great to have, us, have Enda with us today in the IAA, and I'll pass the stage and mic over to him. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to speak to you about uh, recovering out of COVID. Uh, it's great to be part of the IASA Symposium. Someone once said, there are decades when not a lot happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. Now, that was said by Lenin about 100 years ago, Vladimir, not John, and probably encapsulates precisely what our industry has been going through for the past two years and maybe the past six months. But today I want to kind of talk to you about some of the learnings that we've gained from the whole COVID situation and how I think our industry has changed and changed for the better and really is now back on a, on a footing to pre-COVID levels of both activity, passenger traffic and capacity. But I suppose let's think about some post-COVID-ish thoughts because it's not really gone yet. Certainly we're seeing huge levels of pent-up demand um, and that's in leisure and in business a major bounce in air travel, uh, which we're already seeing. And, and those of you who will remember the uh, uh, aftermath of 9-11, 2002 was one of the strongest years aviation had ever seen. Um, but 9-11 uh, reduced aviation capacity by 6%. COVID has reduced it by 60%. So we have a long way to come back. But certainly we're seeing the, the business beginning to come back. One of the interesting features as well is that business traffic, as in trip travel in the premium cabins, um, is completely off the chart in terms of demand. A lot of commentators have said that Zoom and Teams would have been the death of business travel. Not so. The data is showing us that the demand is, is very strong. And, you know, that will bring with it problems that we had before COVID. Airport congestion is going to be coming back into the fore. We're seeing that at the moment. There'll also be, I think, a shake up amongst some of the airlines. Um, many, many people, I suppose, expected for more airlines to fail. Not as many did, but I think we still have some way to go with fuel touching $100, $110 a barrel, it's always a warning sign for carriers. Um, and certainly a possible increase in leased aircraft as airlines prefer to hold on to cash in the advance of something happening. In terms of Emirates, we're very much now back to, almost back to where we were. Um, all of our 140 uh, 777 fleet are flying. Um, 70 of our A380s are flying. We hope to have 90 flying by the end of the year. We've obviously got 123. Um, we won't get them all in the air this year. 130 destinations being served. So about 70% of the pre-COVID capacity. Hoping to get that by up to 80% by summer. And by May, we'll be deploying about a million seats a week. So that's very much back to kind of pre-COVID levels. Forward outlook is very strong. Um, and as I said, continued demand for first and premium. And this is really driven by markets opening. Uh, we saw Australia open, big market for Ireland, New Zealand beginning to open. Um, Thailand, India. This will all feed into the growing of capacity and in Ireland we're delighted to be able to confirm finally that we'll go back to our double daily operation from the 1st of September and this will not only give capacity increases on the Dublin-Dubai route, it will open up connections beyond Dubai uh, where 80% of our customers want to travel. But one of the couple of things we've really learned from COVID, it's very easy to shut down but really harder to, to, to uh, ramp back up. And it's a fact, apparently, sadly, that more people perish on Everest on the way down than on the way up. 
And certainly we're seeing that at Dublin, we're seeing it at London, at Birmingham, Glasgow, in the US. Airports struggling with uh, security queues, with check getting check-in staff, getting fueling staff, baggage handlers. So that supply chain um, um, pain point is, is very much in evidence. Um, as I said, I don't think Teams and Zoom are affecting business travel, but certainly networks that were dismantled will take some time to come back. You know, Aer Lingus will be operating a lot of transatlantics this summer, but that network of using Dublin as a hub be interesting to see just how quickly that regains the kind of numbers that it had pre-COVID. But we're still learning and we need more time. And then there's cargo, that one little element that for years was the orphan to many carriers, but became the rock star over COVID. And I kind of describe it as a cargo renaissance, where when you couldn't carry passengers, um, airlines like Emirates certainly continued to carry cargo. Uh, and it really became a huge contributor to the business. In the Emirates case in Ireland, certainly 80% of our revenue was coming through from cargo, whereas the flip side would be the norm in terms of uh, pre-COVID or, or where we are now, where 80% is coming from passenger. But certainly both supply and demand were simultaneously affected. So you had airlines pulling back from markets like China, for example, where flights were reduced, but manufacturers ramping up their activity. How many of us were buying much more items on uh, internet sites like Amazon during, the co during COVID than maybe before? And all of these items had to be shipped. So you had this perfect storm where supply chain congestion and disruption, manufacturers turned to air cargo. Now manufacturers would normally not go near air cargo because it has usually been up to 12 and a half times the price of uh, sea cargo. But with rising prices on sea cargo uh, and demand, it's now only three times more expensive. So a much more uh, viable option for manufacturers in terms of getting their products. And we found that in Ireland as well, that being able to carry uh, cargo from Dublin beyond, I suppose it, it kept a lot of supply chains open for Irish exporters. But with the 777 carrying 25 tonnes of cargo in the hold, it really began to be a major contributor to the business. Um, and air cargo demand grew by 9% September 21 compared to pre-COVID levels, which again is a, is a very big number. So I suppose some of the earnings on the cargo side, the com combination increased demand and constraints in cargo resulted in unprecedented rate increases. But manufacturers were paying those increases because they needed to get the goods away. The real question, I guess, is what does this mean as we recover and we come out and we emerge from COVID? And I suppose the facts are that airlines are taking cargo now much more seriously and they're investing in aircraft. Emirates has signed a purchase agreement for two 777 freighters. Singapore Airlines have signed for seven A350 freighters, Air Canada, Air France. So airlines that you know, had a cargo department, but really I suppose it's only now that the value was coming through. Um, Emirates has been investing in cargo for years. Um, and really one of the big initiatives was the whole cool chain of refrigeration at Dubai, where temperatures can reach the 40s being able to transport um, refrigerated pharma through the airport um, undamaged and, and fit for purpose. So we're now building on that and, and it's really something that I think the airline will, will continue to invest in. The other element that we're investing as we emerge from COVID is something that we had launched, we launched in 2020, which is premium economy. But this year we'll be uh, commencing an 18 month retrofit program um, on 105 aircraft. Now, from my own experience, retrofitting aircraft, very expensive. You seldom get the return. But the difference in this case is that we'll be holding, Emirates will be holding on to these aircraft now a little bit longer than we would have before. So it makes economic sense. So 52 A380s will be retrofitted with premium economy, 53 uh, 777s. We'll also be looking to install a new business class product of a one two one layout. We have the one, uh, the two, three, two at the moment, and that middle seat is never that popular. So we're seeing can we just ad adapt it to make it much more customer friendly. Initially, we've got six aircraft, and as new deliveries come on board, these will be obviously installed with the premium economy product. But as I said, the retrofit program, which commenced at the end of this year, will be able to, I suppose, really have almost half the fleet um, with this product, and something that is currently deployed on on Frankfurt, on Heathrow, on Paris and New York, but obviously will be rolled out as we get uh, further along. The other issue that we're working on in the background is the whole area of sustainability. And specifically, I want to just mention sustainable aviation fuel. 
um, which we've signed an MOU with, with G GE, to operate a 777-300 by the end of this year with 100% um, sustainable aviation fuel. It's current, we've, we, we, our first flight was in 2017, but it's something that we believe in. It's, it's fulfilling the mandate from IATA for, for, um, to, to reach targets in this area. Uh, and I suppose it just shows that the airline is as concerned about sustainability as it should be, and as the rest of the industry is. And I suppose this is a, uh, a concrete example of movement in that direction. The other thing I wanted to tell you about was the whole area of innovation. It's something that, if you go back 35 years since Emirates uh, you know, emerged as a, as, as, a, as a serious player, where we were the first airline to have showers on the 380, the first airline to have a 46-seater lounge at the back of one of our aircraft. So that sense of innovation continues. And what we've done is, or we will be doing, is repurposing the Emirates Pavilion at Expo to really become now a centre for innovation. And we're drawing on you know, minds from all over the world to help us in that quest to develop future-focused products um, relating to the metaverse, NFTs, so non-fungible tokens, and Web3, and really take things to the next level. Um, and we want to build some signature brand experiences along with both alongside both collectible and utility NFTs. Now, what do we mean by that? Obviously, we know NF NFTs are one of a kind, whereas Bitcoin is like a currency. So it's entirely possible we could use NFTs in the future for tickets or as part of a frequent flyer program. If you achieve a certain amount of mileage, an NFT will signify uh, a, a level of your, the amount of traveling you're doing. So all of this uh, is, I suppose, geared towards taking the airline into the next stage of its development uh, and bringing things forward. So like just sort of to, to wrap up, thinking of the future, thinking where we're going, from my own sense and my experience, like it's really clear resilient business models will survive. You'll see the strong low cost carriers, the strong legacy carriers who have a defined business model, they will survive. I think at a time of flux, at a time of, um, I suppose, chaos, and our industry is, is marked by that. If you look back longitudinally over the last 50 years, every 10 years there's a crisis whether it's um, Lehman Brothers, whether it's 9-11, whether it's a fuel crisis, obviously nothing like COVID, but the resilient business models are always the ones that, that survive. I think Emirates have the right, I have a question mark here, but it's actually a statement. I believe we have the right sized aircraft. When COVID hit, airlines were scrabbling amongst, uh, over themselves to retire large aircraft, which probably were due to reti be retired anyway. And, you know, grounding A380s and grounding 777s. Um, we held on to ours, and I think as the demand that is clearly manifesting itself at the moment continues into this year and next year, those airlines with the largest units are the ones that can carry that traffic. And it's quite interesting that airlines that grounded these large aircraft are now quietly bringing them back into service because they need them. And I think that's a good um, indicator as the strength of our business as we go forward. I think in terms of the consumer, it's really going to be about more bucket list holidays and short breaks. I think we're seeing it already, passengers treating themselves to Australia, to the Maldives, um, to the Far East, booking business class. That's going to continue. I'm not so sure we're going to see the same amount of very short hop travel, um, maybe over to a football match, shopping trip, as we did. I think people are going to travel, but they make it, they're going to make it count. I think consumers are also going to trust brands that they're, they're going to choose brands that they trust. Um, and that will not only count for airlines, it'll count for travel agencies as well. Uh, and I think we're already seeing a, a stronger appetite for online booking directly with airlines. Um, and really, in anticipation of, of something maybe going wrong, that direct relationship with the carrier is, is very, very important. And I think overall, customers are going to value, look for value and the overall experience over price. They will pay maybe a little bit more, but in return for that, they will be, they'll have high expectations on what the experience they're going to get uh, and the, value, the overall value of the trip. And then finally, carriers need to be innovative more than ever. This is not a time to, to stop innovating. This is not a, not a time to cut back on investment in your brand. If anything, it's a time to spend more on it and really show that consumer that your carrier is the one that they should choose and that you're constantly innovating and meeting and exceeding the expectations of that customer. Uh, who, who pay all our wages. So that is really all I had for you this morning and uh, thank you for listening and I really hope you have a really good day. Thank you.
Perfect. Thanks very much, Enda. Um, great to learn both about Emirates and also a real pro at presenting, so I'll hopefully take some tips from that. Um, now we will start off with uh, our first of our interviews. I'll hand you over to Josh, our Head of Engagement. He'll be interviewing Julie Garland, the CEO of Avtrain and Vertex Aero. Um, I will let Josh introduce himself and Julie, and uh, I'll hand them over right now. <laughs> Next up, we have a interview with Julie Garden of Avtrain, of Vertex Aero, and of FMCI. So uh, to introduce myself, my name is Josh Reynolds, and I'm Head of Engagement with IASA. I'm also a student in DCU studying aviation management. So Julie, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's great to have you. I know we had you on last year, and you were so good that we've decided to uh, invite you back again. So thank you very much for joining us today. Josh, it's such a pleasure to be here and to see um, you year on year growing and the, the, the level of the speakers that you have at the symposium is an incredible lineup for the day and really excited to be involved and just delighted to be involved, you know, on an ongoing basis to be able to update everything that we've moved on so much in this industry since this time last year. So it's great to be back and really appreciate the invitation. No problem. And what a lineup it is. So to, to start us off, you have an extensive background in the aviation industry. Can you talk us through briefly, because I know you've got loads of experience in loads of different sections. Sure, um, sure, Josh. So I started off my career in aviation um, back in the last century, and where I started as an apprentice with Aer Lingus as an aircraft maintenance engineer. So it was turning spanners, um, gave a really good foundation from a technical point of view to, to, to where I am now. Spent about 10 years. Um, I was with Aer Lingus. It became Team Aer Lingus as an apprentice. And then I also worked with Hunting Cargo Airlines and then which became um, our contractors, then ASL. And then I went on and I had always wanted to go flying. It had always been my dream to be a pilot since I was about eight years of age. And my grandfather had me in the flight simulator at Aer Lingus. So I decided to go off and I studied uh, myself. I was a self wasn't a self improver, which I suppose it's called rather than being sponsored by an airline. I did some of my flight training in South Africa and out in Western Airport as well, the National Flight Center, and became an instructor there. Then into Air Aaron as a first officer flight safety officer, and then as a captain, a training captain, and then into CityJet as a direct entry captain, and as a type rating instructor with CityJet. And then I decided I wasn't going to retire from the left seat of an aeroplane, even though it's the best view from the office that you're ever going to get, um, I wasn't going to retire from it. So I decided to study law, and I became a barrister. I got called to the bar in 2010, and I practiced for five years. Then I started really missing being involved in aviation on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm back into the director of compliance for Norwegian Airlines, which really encompassed everything from the technical, you know, manned, manned aircraft operations side and the legal as well. When we're, I was there as a director of compliance. Um, I, at, around that time, I started getting involved in the drone industry. I would be talking to the Aviation Authority and they, there was a proliferation of drones starting off. And this is around 2015. And we looked towards putting together a framework that allowed this industry to flourish at that time. And it's a huge foresight on the part, on the part of the Aviation Authority here, um, really looking forward so that they could see how innovative this, this new industry, emerging industry was um, at that time. We set up the Unmanned Aircraft Association, worked very closely with the Irish Aviation Authority then to get a statutory instrument, which is the foundation of the rules and regulations around drone pilots and operators. We now have the ASA regulation, which has replaced that and has really given us this regulatory framework to really make a huge jump forward. And that's where Avtrain came from. So in 2019, I set up Avtrain and started doing the training and certification on a full-time basis. Before that, I'd only ever been doing it part-time. But, um, but so Avtrain has been in existence now since 2019 and going from strength to strength. That's great to hear. And, and with Avtrain, if you can give us a brief explanation of, of what Avtrain is, because it's a very new type of company. And... What, what drone operations are you having to enable through training um, UAS pilots uh, with Avtrain? And has there been a significant uptake since COVID-19? Sure. 
So to go up train is um, it's we're what's called a recognised entity. So that means we're approved by the Irish Aviation Authority for the training and certification, and we carry out. Um, so, so we carry out open category training and specific category training. And what that means is a drone pilot can come to us and they sit through a course. They, we, we carry out an exam with them and then through the Aviation Authority, they're granted a license. And that license is twofold. One is as a pilot and the other is as an operator. So very similar to the, to the previous system that we have, but this is now an EASA license. So it's a European license so they can travel across Europe with this license. Um, we do the as I say, training certification, but we also do independent verification of compliance and um, up to a high level of robustness. Now that all sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but really what it means is, is that we measure, we look at, at um, operators and we look at the mitigations that they're putting in place to mitigate risks to uninvolved people, whether they're on the ground or in the air. And then they have to demonstrate to different levels how robust those safety measures are. And robustness means we measure how safe they are. And we also measure the proof that safety has been improved by that amount. So we do all of the independent verification for all of that. So we're a recognized entity and, um, and that gives us, as I say, our Euro European qualifications rather than just an Irish national license. We're also putting in at the moment for our UK approvals so that when a person comes to us in Ireland and carries out their uh, training certification, they get their European qualification, but they also will get ultimately a UK qualification as well, which allows them to operate in the UK and also in the north of Ireland. Um, you mentioned about COVID. I think the, the big changes that COVID brought around to the industry was um, they're twofold. One is the acceptance of online learning and really people accepting. And, and uh, it has gone from not just acceptance, but people have really embraced it because they see it as a very convenient way to be able to learn and absorb information. And so it's allowed us. And the other thing is, is the societal acceptance of drones in day-to-day -day life. And I think Bobby Healy from MANA certainly has done a lot as well to, to integrate drones into our day-to-day -day life and the public societal acceptance of that. We're much more inclined now to accept that we don't always need to have human contact. Although we miss it and we really missed it desperately over the last two years, it has, it, you know, it, it very much um, allowed for drones to become part of what we see as the future. And um, I think that that there's a big piece around that, particularly with larger drones and the people that we work with. And um, you asked about some of our customers as an example. Um, there's, there's really, you know, the advantages of using drones. We've got, um, we're just signed a contract with a Ukrainian company and, we're, and who, look, who do humanitarian aid. Um, it's um, Air Logistics and they have set up an Irish company called Air, Tour Air Taurus which, as you know, from Air Taurus days, there's so many synergies there looking. And uh, Taurus is actually a, um, an ancient Crimean tribe. And that's what the air, that's what their Irish company is actually named after. But of course, Air Taurus means, uh, from, from our previous airline in Ireland, means Air Journey. So there's a lot of synergies there. So we're working very closely with them in the Ukraine. And they also do a lot of humanitarian work in Africa. And they'll be looking to operate much larger drones. These are, are the drones that we would consider to be aircraft. Um, you know, very large drones and carrying, you know, the, the equivalent of, say, a 40 foot container full of humanitarian aid from place to place. So these are big aircraft and we're doing all of their certification process with us. So the, the other side of that, we're working with a company here called Ampex, who are looking um, at generating electricity using drones, using fixed wing drones that fly on a tether. And as a tether comes in and, and goes out, it generates electricity. And they have a 500 kilogram drone that's going to be flying around on a tether. So these aren't just small drones, you know, being used either in the delivery realm or in survey work or search and rescue. And um, we also have a contract with the Irish Coast Guard. We do a lot of work with them. Um, we're looking really to much larger aircraft and, and moving up in towards this certified category. And um, we did um, down, we've also looking towards beyond visual line of sight as the next step really in this emerging industry. Vis uh, most of what we do now with drones is visual line of sight where the pilot and the operator has sight of the drone. And what we'll be doing in the future now is really looking towards beyond visual line of sight. And we'll be doing quite a lot of proof of concept around that. Fantastic, it sounds like things are really scaling up in terms of drones and, and the business as well. And I've, I've seen that you and, and AppTrain have described um, a great philosophy around drones, that drones should be doing jobs that are dull, dirty, and dangerous. So do you have an example of some of them for our audience, just to um, open, open people's minds to the sort of jobs that drones might be able to uh, accomplish and be innovative to, in order to accomplish them? 
Sure. So uh, when you look at we we yeah exactly say the three Ds dull, dirty, and dangerous. And when you talk about dull, you're thinking about something that a human being is going to get bored doing. That is repetitive. Um, it, that's a repetitive job that can be very easily carried out by a drone. So for example, something like a power line inspection or railway track inspection, even roads mapping of roads networks, where you want to continuously um, monitor something. So that's the dull part of it. Dirty, I would talk maybe things like chemicals, sometimes crop spraying, things like that, where you're distributing chemicals, but also, um, you know, looking towards, um, you know, our big water funnels and when the entry goes out and we want to inspect those, you know, send a drone in rather than the human being being in them. So, and fuel tanks, all of these things that, you know, where, where you're, you're storing harmful goods. Um, and then the dangerous I would look towards um, things like, you know, search and rescue is certainly one I would put up there, where often the guys who are going out um, to rescue people are going out in really inclement weather conditions, you know, and now we can use this, you know, automated responses um, to this, quickly identify, find a person. And um, we'll still, and also people operating at high levels. So people operating around buildings where you have to put up scaffolding and you have, you're sending people up to operate. And so dull, dirty, dangerous, and I suppose we should put cost in there as well, um, because a lot of the times, you know, what we're looking to do is really reduce, dramatically reduce the cost of for, for the person who's receiving the data, um, you know, so, so dull, dirty, dangerous for sure, um, and that's just some of the examples of them, that's the tip of the iceberg though. Absolutely, it's fantastic, and then moving on from drones to, to something bigger that you're also involved in is Vertex Aero and the Future Mobility Campus Ireland and urban air mobility. So would you be able to briefly go through um, a description of that for our audience and, and describe what it is? Because again, it's very, very new um, and very new concept. Sure, so I suppose what we've been trying to do all along at Train is to make sure that we uh, form the pieces of the jigsaw, then we put the pieces of the jigsaw together. And I suppose with Train we're the glue that holds all those pieces together. So what we've done with um, Future Mobility Campus Ireland, FMCI, and FMCI was originally set up as a center of innovation, a center for um, autonomy. And it is, but that was around cars. So it's Jaguar partners like Jaguar Land Rover, Cisco, um, Seagate. So it's cars, uh, autonomous driving and um, data management through the, the, the gathering and management of data. And we talked to the guys and we layered it on top of that FMCI air. So what we've done with FMCI Air is looking at the synergies between the industries and there's so much that we can learn from the automotive industry in the aviation industry when we look towards autonomy and the lessons that have been learned with autonomy in cars. Um, we've put, um, we've carried out beyond visual line of sight flights down there for proof of concept, integrating supply chain drones into supply chain logistics for FedEx where we operated up to 30 flights a day. And our, and our base at Future Mobility Campus Ireland is right at Shannon Airport. It's literally at the perimeter fence of Shannon Airport. So what we're looking at is really the integration of drone operations on a day-to-day -day basis with air traffic control, with normal airline operations, and, and looking towards integration rather than segregation. So that's the primary focus. We're building a Verti port in Shannon. And Verti ports are like fax machines. There's no point in having one. So we'll be looking at to, to, to broaden that infrastructure then across Ireland. Um, so that's on one side is FMCI, and that's a big part of the jigsaw. And then what we have on the other side, when we look then towards the um, urban air mobility and we look towards eVTOL aircraft, the pilots who are going to fly, no, no matter what, eVTOL is designed in the future to be fully autonomous at some point. But the idea to get from where we are right now to being fully autonomous, we're going to have pilots in these aircraft. Some of the, pilots, some of the aircraft are being designed with pilots in mind. Some of them are being designed with the, the future route removal of that pilot from and, and to be fully autonomous but certainly even just from a societal acceptance point of view you're looking at 10 probably 10 probably up to 15 years before we're going to be looking to those aircraft being fully autonomous and when you think about eVTOL aircraft and you think about a conventional pilot well a conventional pilot either flies helicopters or fixed wing or possibly both but not at the same time and not in the same aircraft and what we have with eVTOL aircraft is we have you know they, they're, they're taking off and landing horizontally and they're flying vertically. So you've got that transition phase as well from horizontal to vertical flight or from vertical flight to horizontal flight. And the pilots are different. They're a hybrid pilot, if you like. So, and also the skill sets with the levels of autonomy that are in eVTOL aircraft. And the skill sets are very different to the pilots that you have in your, in your commercial airliner. So we're looking at with Vertex Aero is really training today for, tomorrow, for tomorrow's aircraft. 
Uh, so that gives you an overview uh, with Aptrain in the middle, FNCR on one side and Vertex Air on the other side. And as I say, it's really trying to bring together all the pieces of the jigsaw and make Ireland a center of excellence for autonomy, not just, uh, not just the individual companies. We have to grow the infrastructure and the ecosystem. Fantastic. And I suppose one of the big questions that our audience would want to know is when will we expect to see these EV tolls operating in major cities around the world? And of course, will they ever be operating in Ireland commercially or will we be primarily uh, used as a test bed for these? So I think starting off, Ireland is so well placed to be a test bed for these aircraft. But that's this year and next year and the year after we start then getting into commercial operations Talking about 2024 in Paris, um, at, par at the Paris Olympics, um, then also we're looking towards 2027, the Ryder Cup, and we would have, we're, we're looking to have our virtual board fully functional at that point and be operating EV tall aircraft from our virtual board at Shannon Airport by 2027. So this is only around the corner. Um, and when you look at the certification and the timelines for certification for these aircraft, most of them are doing test flights at the moment with prototype designs. So you're looking probably a realistic, you know, 18 months to two years, possibly slightly further out. So you're looking towards 2024 for operations. And after that, then um, there will be some level of proving. So 2025, I think, is a really realistic expectation. So when we look to, to 2027 for the Ryder Cup, that's a really achievable target. And yes, I do think we're going to see the proliferation of them in Ireland. Ireland is ideally placed for these aircraft. They're designed for short routes. They're designed for short hops. We can connect all of our cities for a much more economical than it's going to take and greener as well. When we look towards sustainability, and we look towards um, carbon emissions and we're talking about electric aircraft, you know, zero carbon emissions and being able to get from city to city in Ireland. They, Ireland is perfectly placed and perfectly designed for the future of EV tall aircraft. So, yes, we'll be seeing proliferation of them in our skies. That's brilliant to hear. And just to round it up, you've, you've pretty much done it all in aviation. You've been in, in maintenance, you've been flying, you've been in law, you've been in compliance and regulation. You've been in drones, now EV tolls. Is there anything yet to come for Julie? And what has kept you motivated all these years and kept you going? Well, I think that what I managed to achieve at the moment is really bringing together everything that I've done in my career. It's bringing the technical with the operational experience, the legal side, it's bringing it all together. And what I see my role in the future and the, ev the evolution of this industry as it's happening now, it's so exciting and um, it's it's innovation every day is different and really what I see as I described it earlier on as myself what I see as my role in this is being the glue is bringing bringing everybody together and then being the glue that holds it all together and um, it, it's really important that we have people in the industry that cross over these pillars because this new emerging industry innovation and crosses the pillars it crosses the pillars from airworthiness into flight operations it's the first time ever we're going to see um technical mitigations used in flight operations we don't do that in airlines you know and now we have this new opportunity for these new emerging airlines and um, and i would hope to see myself as a leader in that field really what we need is ireland as a center of excellence for autonomy and um, not just individual companies and hopefully um i'll be a catalyst to make sure that that happens brilliant julie thank you so much unfortunately we're out of time i feel like we could go all day um, but thank you again for joining us for uh, IASA's sixth annual symposium. It's been an absolute pleasure, and hopefully we'll be talking to you again next year. Thanks, Josh, and best of luck with the rest of the day and uh, and on into the future. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks. Um, apologies for the technical difficulties. We are working away trying to get it uh, back. Nice and smooth, um, but on top of our technical difficulties, unfortunately, Dermot um, will not be able to join us just yet. We're trying to get that stream going, but I'm glad to say that Andy O'Shea is on the line. Um, Andy O'Shea, for anyone who is an aspiring pilot, he is the chief, chief executive and co-founder of the Airline Pilot Club. Andy will be discussing breaking down barriers within flight training so that those who are fit to fly can fly. Super, thanks very much, Matthew. Uh, it's great to be here again at another IASA Symposium. So uh, to everybody, uh, hi, I'm Andy O'Shea, the CEO of the Airline Pilot Club, or APC for short. 
I want to speak to you today about how we have set up APC to break down barriers to entry into the airline pilot career and to establish a more diverse and sustainable supply of talent to our industry. Um, an awful lot of what APC is based on is based on my experience. So if you don't mind, I'll just take you quickly through my background. After 15 fantastic years in the Irish Air Corps, I joined Ryanair and I spent 28 years there, as you can see on the screen. Uh, 18 years of those were as head of training. And during that time, we had an explosive period of growth in the airline where we grew from 26 aircraft, uh, 77 200s to 460 uh, 70, 77 NGs. And the key thing is that we did it safely. Uh, and the, the Ryanair Training Department standards now and then uh, were recognized as being um, appropriate for developing that many people from uh, low hour time just having got their license, bringing over 10,000 people of those, uh, that kind of description, to being very safe and very effective airline pilots. Um, as head of training, I would have engaged with many, many ATOs, that's called an approved training organization, which is a flying school. And I would have engaged with them in order to gauge their, uh, their, their quality, their standards of uh, instructor, uh, instructor standardization, their training. And as a result, all of that information and all of that experience has fed into the creation of a community of partner ATOs that APC has established over the last number of years. Um, because I was so involved in pilot training in, in Ryanair, which is the largest airline in, uh, in Europe, um, I was invited to uh, join EASA, the European Aviation Safety Agency, in a number of roles. And I ended up being chair of the, uh, the EASA Aircrew Training Policy Group which is an advisory group that sits beside the Director of Safety and Standards in EASA. And we got a lot of work done there during our time. One of the key things uh, we worked on, MPL, multi-pilot license, but also this thing called the Airline Pilot Standard or APS MCC. We also recommended that um, to the Commission that mandatory assessments for all professional students going on to a professional pilot course should be implemented uh, as a kind of mandatory uh, feature of their progress. Uh, that was rejected, but they did say that um, pilot assessments before professional training were industry best practice. And that is something that you know, I'd like you to take with you as we go through the APC uh, experience. After I left Ryanair, I set up a consultancy, I've been working with airlines and training organizations since. But the main thing that I've established is this airline pilot club. And that's the thing that really drives my passion to try and make sure that um, the concept behind APC is understood and that people embrace it and benefit from it. So let me take you through it a little bit further. Why would I set it up? As I said before, many occasions, why wouldn't I just go off and play really bad golf instead of taking on the burden of setting up APC? Well, the fact is I wanted to mitigate three facts that I established during my career, my long career in this game. And that is that, and it might be blindingly obvious, but it has to be said, not everyone is suited to become a safe airline pilot. That is a fact. The other fact is that not all ATOs produce the same quality of training. Even though they're all compliant with regulation, in many cases, there's a big difference between what they, their output in terms of uh, the quality of their training. And the last fact is that the funding, the current funding of pilot training distorts talent supply because 80% or more of students who are in training in this part of the world and in North America, um, as we call it, the bank of mom and pop have to fund the training. It's self-funded. And that restricts the number of people that the airline industry is drawing from to that small group of people who can actually pay for their own training. And clearly that distorts the ability uh, for our industry to attract the right people from all sorts of geographies, which will allow airlines to expand their network growth in a safe and affordable way. The other thing I wanted to do is to create this uh, a platform that enables um, APC to attract new and different people into the industry, to remind them that the airline pilot career is a fantastic career with great opportunities for diverse activities, skill sets, uh, ambition. Um, so our, our setup is designed to attract, screen and prepare lots of people who might otherwise not have thought of becoming airline pilots, but who could be very well suited to become airline pilots into their career path. We also want to recognize and encourage high quality ATOs. Um, 
as I said, in my experience in Ryanair, I came across a lot of ATOs, and I have a good idea of what uh, a good ATO looks like, what makes it uh, a good ATO, and I have a good idea of what an not so good ATO is and what happens there. And the whole idea is to recognize and encourage and recommend our members to our high-quality ATOs. Um, the last one is to try and establish a funding model that will provide unsecured lending to quality-assured students who would attend a quality assured ATO and who would have the offer of a career with a specified airline in that quality based system. And we are very, very close to establishing this uh, unsecured lending system, which we hope will be in place by the end of 2022. So to try and distill a lot of information into uh, 15 minutes, um, I've got a little animation here that, uh, that will allow me to talk about the various aspects of how we hope to enable more people from lots of diverse backgrounds to join the airline pilot career. And the first one is that we provide a free online psychometric assessment drawn up by the same psychologists who wrote and who write the uh, Aon full pilot suite of assessments that Ryanair uses, American Airlines uses, uh, Singapore Airlines uses, EasyJet, uh, EasyJet uses. And this is free. It's accessible through our website. Uh, it's delivered to you via the Aon system. And as soon as you finish it, you will get a report, very, very powerful report, which is also free, that allows you to understand your strengths and weaknesses in the context of being a future airline pilot. It has a traffic light system of being ready, almost ready, or not ready. And really, if you get an already score in this uh, assessment, it's kind of telling you that you have a lot of work to do and maybe you don't have the basic fundamentals of um, uh, your psychiatric uh, and uh, cognitive makeup might be suitable to the airline pilot career. So we back that up with the reports, the reports are delivered to you, and then we provide you with free e-learning. Now this e-learning is produced by people who I worked with in the past, very high standard. It is delivered to you by a learning management system, which will be attached to our um, new platform, which is going to be released on or about the 7th of May. And this e-learning will introduce you to all the human aspects of being an airline pilot. So we'll talk about human factors and limitations, crew resource management, threat and error management. And finally, we'll discuss all nine of the pilot competencies that have been identified by ICAO, IATA and EASA. And our belief is that knowledge of these, these, this content, knowing about yourself through the indicative assessment report, and then knowing about their career path and the nature of being an airline pilot will be a fantastic uh, preparation for, for your, um, your selection process with one of our approved ATOs. Um, and remember, we're not just trying to get you to pass a test at an ATO or an airline. We're trying to give you fundamental knowledge and attitudes that you can take forward into your career and be the best possible airline pilot that you can be. So our quality assured ATO is a really important aspect of what we do. We have identified and approached by many ATOs and we have engaged with them in order to create and conduct um, a very detailed review of their documentation, their manuals, their processes, but also their practical training in the classroom, in the simulator and in the aircraft. And we use fantastic subject matter experts who've all been post holders in various positions, um, aviation authority inspectors, huge experience, go in to our ATO colleagues, our partners, and we have a very collegiate approach to uh, conducting this review. I don't like calling it an audit, it's a review. And at the end of it, we produce a report, very detailed, very beneficial to the ATO, and we come up with a list of action items that the ATO has to undertake to close off to our satisfaction, and then they go up on our website and we are happy to recommend to our members that if they go to that ATO, they'll get great training. The ATO won't fold its tent financially overnight and uh, leave you high and dry like still happens every now and then, unfortunately. But also the ATOs have a strong record of providing its graduates with career opportunities in airlines that they're partnered up with or strongly associated with. So that's a really important part of our kind of quality assurance process where we assure the quality of the individual through assessments, the ATO through this really detailed 27 page review process, which you believe. And at the end of that, um, for people, 
in the future, and as I said, hopefully uh, later this year, we'll be able to provide free access to our APC funding system, which will be a uh, unsecured lending. That is to say, you don't need um, a holiday home, you don't need your mum and dad to guarantee the loan. It will be based on you meeting these quality pointers in this system so that at the end of it, you have an opportunity to join an airline such as British Airways, Ryanair, EasyJet, or whatever. So that, that's the process that you would engage with uh, and in when you join the APC uh, community, which is 100% free to you as an aspirant or student pilot. So to summarize, um, APC is what you call a reverse hire, learn to earn community. So reverse hire means that instead of you running around trying to find the right ATO, trying to find the right airline, you sit there with us in our community and we will bring them to you. And we'll only make sure that you engage with the best ATOs. Learn to earn is self-evident. You become a qualified professional pilot in order to earn a salary and start a great career. APC is the distillation of 28 years of my experience in Ryanair, plus lots of other subject matter experts that are associated with the, uh, with the team. And fundamentally, we're trying to correct or mitigate three problem facts that are identified at the beginning of this piece. As I say, everything is free to a registered member. All you have to do is land on the website, choose a, a, a registration option for you, and fill in some information. And at that point, all the great free stuff that I mentioned, plus way more, will be available to you on the APC website. And essentially, we prepare you not just for your assessment with an, with an ATO or an airline, but we're trying to prepare you for the career. And that is so important to us because we don't want to be associated with just trying to get you to a stage where you can pass an assessment. We want to look to the long term and make sure that we equip you in terms of knowledge and attitude so that you can become the best airline pilot that you can be. And finally, we strongly believe that in APC, in our community, you will be able to find a great ATO and you'll be able to start your airline career with the airline pilot club. So that's what I wanted to say to you today. I hope you've taken something from it. And I really look forward to meeting you in our webinars or somehow uh, through the APC community. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Andy, for that. Um, as anyone who's an aspiring pilot will know, it is very tough to get into the training. And Airline Pilot Club is a great resource if you want to log on to them. Um, now, as you can see, we've done a slight bit of redecorating, and that's because I have the absolute pleasure of introducing our lineup for the, our panel on aviation finance. We are delighted to have panel members from all aspects of aviation leasing, and our moderator for the day, Joe O'Mara, is the head of aviation finance at KPMG, so I think he'll have a bit more knowledge on the subject than me. Um, Georgina O'Riordan, a partner at McCann Fitzgerald. Carl Creevy, the Head of Credit Risk at SMBC Aviation Capital, and Colin Carr, Leader of the Aviation Finance Advisory Services at PwC, who make up the rest of our panel members. The focus on today's discussion will be on Ireland's position as a hub of leasing, and they'll also give a bit of background in their roles. mentioned our panelists, it'll be a great panel, hopefully an interesting discussion. Um, we're we're going to try and frame this a, a little bit around the why Ireland piece and why Ireland works, talk about our own career paths and interests we've had across aviation finance, in some cases 30 or 40 or 20 or 10 years. Um, but before we get into the meat of the discussion, I, I thought I would maybe frame it around the why Ireland piece. Um, and I joined KPMG in 2004, and I think I hadn't a concept that airlines didn't own their own aircraft. Um, I started to hear about this aircraft leasing sector, um, and then I started to get an appreciation for how deep Ireland has been um, in that space at, in its origination and its growth. So going back to the outset of GPA back in the 1970s, Ireland was the creator of aircraft leasing, and over the course of the last 50 years, it has always been the world leader in that space. 
And why is that? Well, it comes back down to a couple of reasons. Um, tax, which is probably my area of expertise, uh, I'm a tax partner, talent and track record. Um, and, and maybe picking up that first piece around taxation, why do we get these, you know, super large companies with massive balance sheets coming to Ireland, that that tax piece behind it is really threefold. So we have a 12.5% corporation tax rate in Ireland, which is very attractive compared to you know, most developed countries around the world. We give a tax write-off of an asset when you buy it over an eight-year straight line period. If you have a, an aircraft that typically has a useful life of 20 to 25 years, that's quite advantageous. But most importantly from an Irish perspective is we have a great international tax treaty network. And if you think about aircraft, um, they are a mobile asset class. So while we'll have companies like Aircap and SNBC and Avalon owning hundreds of aircraft in Ireland, they fly all around the world. And their customers are predominantly all around the world. And that means you have cross-border payments. You know, if I have an aircraft on lease to American Airlines or Indigo in India, I have a payment coming into Ireland and I need to be conscious around the withholding tax implication. And Ireland's treaty network is best in class in eliminating or reducing uh, that withholding tax position. So the tax reasons behind it, um, the talent piece really comes back to the sector was created here and the ecosystem around leasing uh, is built up around here. So when you look at the marketing people, the finance people, the legal people, they you know, nowhere in the world compares to Ireland for that level of expertise. And that track record piece is just how long we've been there. You know, as I mentioned, it really is uh, a business that Ireland has been world leading in for over 50 years. Um, so I just wanted to frame that as, as we chatted about it and, and hopefully over the course of the conversation you'll get to hear just what an interesting and exciting environment it is to work in aviation finance. Um, so before we get into the meat of the discussion, and Colm, I, I might start with you um, because you've had a very uh, long and interesting career in aviation finance. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your current role but also maybe your path to where you got to now? Yeah, th thanks Joe. Uh, that was a very good summary by the way about you know, why this industry is so um, important uh, in Ireland, but also why Ireland is so important to this industry across the world. Um, so I, I started in the business back in uh, the mid-1980s uh, with GPA. Um, it's a very long time ago now, and um, the industry has given me a very long, enjoyable, uh, and you know, quite a remunerative career as well. Um, it's, it's a fascinating place to work. Um, I joined PwC um, just two and a half years ago uh, to help build out um, a, a an advisory services practice because when when we think of firms like like your own firm, Joe and ourselves, we think about in the first instance about tax in our industry and then about audit, and we don't realise just the sheer extent of talent there is in these firms that deals with you know consulting type projects across a, a wide ver a ver variety of, of challenges and opportunities that companies face. So what we're doing is helping our aviation clients and finding new people who are find, looking for ways to come into the industry. We focused uh, primarily on what I'd call the money, uh, mainly because as a firm, we have strong relationships with, with capital around the world, particularly with the PE firms in the US. Um, and we all know that you know, capital is a very, very capital intensive industry. And getting the cheapest source of capital can be important, but getting you know, somebody who will invest, so getting the best source of capital is really important as well finding people that will understand the industry, that will understand the challenges and the risks and be prepared to take them. And then structuring the, the, the transactions carefully. There's a lot of tax work obviously involved in getting that right. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. We help people primarily that are looking to raise money. They might be airlines, they might be leasing companies. Uh, we help investors that are trying to deploy capital. Uh, we do a lot of commercial and financial due diligence work for people as well, that, that type of thing. Thanks, Colin. I think that's it, and it is an interesting aspect. A lot of what I would spend my time doing is, is talking to people around the Why Ireland piece. And it is, yeah. it is exactly that. You look, and as I mentioned, the balance sheets of aircraft SORs are just enormous, right? Beyond comprehension. I think someone told me in college that you, know, you have an Irish company that owns north of $10 billion of assets, mm -hmm. and we talk in dollars because that's the predominant way around this sector. I, I, I just would have been able to comprehend it. Um, and, and it is, and Georgina, I'll come to you now, right? Because again, you know, you, you're like us, you're in the professional services type environment, but it's kind of facilitating businesses. Do you want to talk us uh, a little bit around your kind of day-to-day -day and, and maybe when you first learned about the sector and how that's evolved over the course of your career? Sure, yeah, thanks, Joe. 
Um, I suppose very much like you, I remember, you know, as a trainee lawyer starting out and, you know, the, the, the way it works in law firms is you move between the different departments and ended up in our finance department and sitting in our aviation finance team and being struck exactly, as you said, Joe, by the enormity of the industry in Ireland. It's very, very deep roots back to, as Colin mentioned, GPA, you know, the, 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 the founding, I suppose, company in, in the operating leasing world. And I was struck by the, 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 the size of the industry here, I suppose, how interesting it was, because it, certainly at the time of GPA, it was probably the only real cross-border um, industry based in Ireland. And really building on that over the years, you know, the, the ecosystem that you refer to is there, it's very strong, it's, you know, the service providers, like the accountants, like the lawyers, the, the, the technical people, the advisory people on the, on the capital side in, in Column's role. And for us, I suppose, you know, we are there, I, I would say, as a support to the industry. We work with principally um, the lessors, also arrangers, financiers, to help them put together and, um, I suppose, document the deals and structure the deals that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, you asked about, I suppose, my day-to-day, -day, and I suppose I see that as mirroring our clients' day-to-day. -day. So, you know, a lot of our lessor clients, they buy aircraft, new and second-hand, they sell aircraft, they lease aircraft, they deal with all of the day-to-day -day issues that come on their desks from their airline customers. And we are, you know, backing off that in terms of our day-to-day -day interaction with them is around you know a portfolio that's being traded a portfolio that's being financed you know a bond issuance in the capital market in markets where our one of our clients is looking to raise capital to to buy that portfolio that they're in the market looking for it's you know going with them sometimes to meet the customer to document you know a portfolio of leases that they're going to put in place you know, in the past two years, it's been working with them on restructurings, on, um, you know, standing with them, I suppose, as airlines go through, you know, a, a very tough time, um, as they have had in the last two years, working through court and out of court restructuring procedures. Um, so really, it, it is the whatever our clients are doing on a day to day basis is mirrored back into us because th there's really nothing. I mean, we're dealing with very high value assets here that isn't backed off by a legal agreement between our clients and their customers and their counterparties. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And probably taking that theme, um, these aren't static assets. You know, so you kind of think it's sometimes, uh, again, I think that the profile of aircraft leasing, what you've seen, I think from a general media perspective, has increased exponentially, I would say, over the last decade. And sometimes, you know, you go back to maybe the leprechaun economics and the GDP movement, and people are saying, well, all these assets, are they actually doing anything? I think a lot of what you're talking about there is speaking to the real work that has to go in around owning and managing these assets. And over the last couple of years, obviously, that's been hugely challenging. Um, I say, we, you know, myself and Colm and Georgina are in, are in the supporting piece, I'd say. Carl, you're more the cold face. Um, and uh, Carl, uh, as Matthew mentioned, works with SNBC. Carl, do you want to tell us, maybe first off, a tiny bit about SNBC and maybe your career path to where you've gotten to now? Sure, yeah. Um, thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, I, I probably bring a little, something a little bit different, I guess, to the industry in that my background is actually in engineering. I, uh, I studied mechanical engineering in UCD, um, and I joined SNBC Aviation Capital in, in 2005, actually, um, so I've been, been with AC for a number of years now. Um, I guess I was just looking to see, you know, what else I could do with, with my degree, um, and you know, it 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 was a it was just a really really interesting opportunity. So what attracted me, I guess, was just the global nature of the business. Um, you know, the uh, the fact that you, you know you could be dealing with a different country, different market, different airline on any any given day of the week. You know, so um, so in that sense, it was uh, that you know that was initially what um, what attracted me to the uh, to the business. You know. It's uh, yeah. Look, it's 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 a really really interesting business. Um, AC itself is um, owned by two of the biggest um, Japanese uh, financial institutions. Um, we we have a fleet of um, just over three hundred and sixty owned aircraft, um, one hundred and seventy managed aircraft, and then a further two hundred and twenty um, aircraft on order. So. 
Um, in that sense, we are one of the top tier lessors. I think depending on how you, you measure it, we're either number three or number four. I would say three. Uh, yeah. We'd say three. <laughs> I, think, I actually think it is so, three. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so, you know, AC has been up and running since, since 2001. Um, you know, really, really interesting times, though, um, you know, since then, particularly the, the last three years, you know, we've, you know, we've, we've had our own challenges, um, you know, and we're working through that. But um, yeah, yeah, very, very interesting, uh, interesting can, times. Can I stick with you for a second, Carol, mm. because I look at, maybe we'll keep on that interesting times theme. Um, so, Georgina, you talked maybe the life cycle a little bit of aircraft, and you talked about it being a 20 or 25 year asset. That probably has three or four lease iterations, right, as right. it goes through. Mm -hmm. um, SMBC are predominantly a young fleet focus. You know, so so you, you would look at lessors and really how they acquire aircraft is, is in two ways. You either go straight to the manufacturer and you put in a big whop in order, or you enter what we call the sale and lease back market. Um, and that's effectively where an airline goes to Boeing or Airbus and they, they order an aircraft and before it delivers, they, they go out to lessors and say, listen, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to take all the capital outlay here. Would you purchase it and lease it back to me on an eight or a 12 year lease? SNBC's was very interesting because I'd say they were, they were pretty ballsy, right? So I go back over the last couple of years and when COVID hit and the market retrenched and capital got scared, you guys got brave. Do you want to talk a little bit around what SNBC did, uh, maybe since the outset of COVID, around that kind of sale and lease back market? Yeah, sure. So look, I, I, I think in a lot of ways, aviation capital is very lucky in, in that the, you know, the, the shareholders that we have are in the sector for, for the long haul. And, and you know, I think we've seen in, in, in recent years, not every player in the sector is necessarily in, in, in it for the long haul. Aviation Capital is set up as a full service leasing platform so that, you know, when the tough times come, as they have in the last two or three years with both, um, you know, Russia and COVID, we are set up to work through those, work through those challenges. And again, not every aircraft leasing company is necessarily set up. And we, you know, we've seen some new entrants come in in, in the last number of years. Um, and, you know, you know, that may not. That, so we may see some more uh, consolidation, I guess, in, in the market going forward uh, in that. But I, I guess AC is well placed because of the shareholders that we have. Um, you know, we, we, we are owned by Sumitomo Corp and uh, Sumitomo Mitsui Financial Group. As I said, two of the biggest uh, financial institutions in Japan. Um, you know, so, it, you know, we're able to access, um, you know, capital at very favorable rates. We've, you know, and, we, and our shareholders are very supportive of the business. So, uh, so in that sense, you know, we, we're, we're in the sector for the long haul, you know. And, and, and Colm, you, you know, so you know Japan very well, going back to uh, yeah. uh, earlier parts of your career. And also, Colm, you, you probably have the longest career of us here. It's always been a very cyclical sector. Um, yeah. And if you're kind of looking at it now as a college student going, why would I go near aviation when the thing is in the tank, right? <laughs> um, and we're seeing obviously this 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 amazing recovery um, and this pent up demand that's there. Thinking back over those cycles you've seen, what has that kind of taught you about the sector? And if you were look, talking to a student now around the interesting career aviation finance can offer you, what, what would you tell them a little bit around the ups and downs that come from working in the sector? Um, yeah, I have had the longest career, Joe. I think it's been almost 40 years now, uh, and I'm still enjoying it uh, very, very much. Um, you know, people often comment back on the GPA days and say how, how challenging it must have been you know, it, it, to be there at the very beginning of a new, a new industry. Um, and it, was, it had its challenges in the sense that, you know, we were going into countries that, you know, we, there was no, we had to work out the, the, the uh, what the regulations were, what the likelihood of repossession was, how to insure aircraft, etc. But you know, there's also the fact that we had a, a huge market to work with, okay? and we also had inflation working in our favour. Like you can imagine the days now when you can buy an aircraft today uh, and not worry terribly about its residual are long gone. But in our case, as long as the aircraft was kind of covering itself with lease rentals and covering its uh, its you know ownership costs, the reality was that aircraft values were very robust. So if there's one thing that I've seen over the years, it's that it is a good long-term asset in the sense that, as you said earlier, you buy it and it has a 25-year life potentially and will hold its value fairly strongly over that period. Okay? Um, it was even stronger back then, but just that, that's one change that I have seen. Um, 
the, the, the industry, to, to going back to that student that's kind of graduating and why would they join the industry, looking that it's in, in such a challenging position right now. Well, if you look at the long term, you know, trend in this industry in terms of its growth, and if you track that against global GDP, there's a remarkable correlation between the two. Okay? So if we believe, and I do genuinely believe, that the world will recover from these crises and move forward again, we can assume that aviation will grow at least you know, as strongly as world GDP will grow going forward. Um, and, and that's you know, after a couple of shocks. We had um, you know, uh, the, the first significant recession in the industry uh, after you know, um, uh, the Gulf Wars. Then we had 9-11. Uh, we had the SARS crisis. We had the global financial crisis. We've had COVID. Now we've had Russia. And already we see the industry beginning to recover from, from COVID. So I wouldn't be put off, certainly, in looking at this industry because of the situation as it is in the world right now. I think it will recover, Joe, and there'll be plenty of opportunity. Um, the other thing to students considering careers in the industry is just to consider the sheer variety of roles you know, that you can undertake. Like, we're, we're talking here about you know, a tax person, you know, an engineering person, a legal person, and an accountant, you know, and, and we've all had very interesting careers across the sector. Um, you know, I would recommend to people that they, you know, get good training early on, that they join firms that are supportive of developing people. Um, firm, the professional uh, development firms are, like, are obviously very strong on that, as are some of the leasing companies. And then, you know, uh, you know, several years into the industry, just make your mind up. Are you going after you know, a sectoral expertise? Do you, do you want to be on the engineering side, the technical side, the legal side, the marketing side, you know, risk management side, um, capital raising side, treasury side? It's, it's just a phenomenal industry in terms of the opportunity that it creates for people. And it's an enjoyable industry to work in as well. Yeah, and, and Georgina, building on that point, I wholeheartedly agree. And like, like the things you really like about working in the sector. So when, when I kind of stand back and I say, well, I, I've worked across the financial services, be it banking, asset management, insurance, and aircraft leasing over the guts of 20 years. Um, and I love aviation above and beyond all, right? And, and part, part of that, uh, my wife works in it, uh, and I met her in KPMG <laughs> doing aircraft leasing. Um, but, but part of it as well it is really we've world leading companies here. So, as you say, SNBC, the third largest, third largest, lessor in the world, headquartered in Ireland. The CEO is here, the CFO is here, the C suite is here. You know, Aircap, the largest lessor in the world, who bought the second largest lessor in the world. The CEO is an Irish guy, right? And you see, when you get to interact with those companies, it is a little bit different to other areas of financial services and work a good bit of insurance. And you would have, you know, you're dealing with big companies, but subsidiaries, you know, and ultimately the really key, the big decision makers yeah. are in the parent company in Bermuda or Germany. That's not the case with this sector. And it's one of the reasons why I just find it so invigorating and interesting. And that feeling of adding, not alone to helping your clients can achieve really interesting things, but helping the Irish economy achieve interesting things. Um, your thoughts in that area, right? Why you really enjoy, which I'm assuming you do, working in the sector? Absolutely. Um, I think I agree with all of that. I mean, I think for me, one of the big attractions, you know, when I qualified as a solicitor and, you know, very much like you, Joe, you know, our finance department works with funds, insurance companies, you know, corporate lending outfits here, um, you know, shadow banking, um, you know, th th all areas of the financial sector. But for me, the big thing about aviation, and, and this struck me early on, as you say, the, the big decision makers, the key decision makers are based here. Um, I, I can't remember the exact stats, but I think nine of the top 10 have their headquarters here of the, the, the leading global operating lessors, whatever measure you, you measure them by. The, the, the C-suite is here, all the decisions are taken here. And I think, you know, as a, a graduate or somebody in college looking at this as an industry, that's a fantastic learning opportunity, I think, um, because you are entering an industry where the best and the brightest and you know are here in Ireland and in any number of the you know whether it's the service provider side whether whether it's the operating leasing side whether it's the technical man asset management side you will be able to work with you know the, the the best brains in the industry and that is the best route route I think to professional development and growth and to moving into an area as Colm said and this is true, I think, even as a lawyer or a, you know a tax advisor or an accountant, in this industry there is a lot of I, I would say um, fluidity across the, mm. the, the the expertise. A lot of people who've trained with us in in McCann Fitzgerald as lawyers 
go in-house to the leasing companies and then they move out of the legal function and they move into marketing or they move into you know the trading function or, or the credit side and um, so th there's great scope for I think developing your career across any different number of sectors within the industry um, and I think that's one of the key attractions of it um, because I think very often you know in, when you're at graduate stage you're not quite sure where your interests will lie and, and that's normal I think you know you've, you've been exposed to I suppose the, the academic side of whatever discipline you're studying but once you get into this industry I think the industry encourages people to to move to look at other areas to try out other areas within within the leasing companies within the within the industry generally so it gives all of that opportunity which I think is unique in terms of industries based here in Ireland. Yeah, and that's a really interesting point, and I think it's that it's collegiality, right? Is, is mm. I guess I think would, would set apart the sector in a very, very strong <coughs> way, and um, you know, your large lessors, your mid-sized, your asset arrangers, sure they're competitors, right, w with one another, but they're also customers with one another, mm -hmm. um, and and that's where I think it does differentiate itself from from most of the other sectors I've worked in. While SNBC and Aircap might be going in and looking to get the best deal they can from Airbus or Boeing, you know, down the line when you trade out of that aircraft in four or six years, you might be looking for an Aircastle to come and buy it. Right? Mm -hmm. It suits different people at different times to divest, and it's very interesting. Then, and we'd all be on um, a, a pretty robust and very exciting and interesting conference circuit that we're we're probably just shortly getting back into. That collegiality, that that community sense from leasing, I think is amazing, right? and I, I just don't think you get. Mm -hmm. It in other sectors and there is a genuine warmth you know I, I'd say across different people or competitors that you would be uh, interacting with and it happens on the lessor side it happens with professional mm -hmm. services yeah. um, can I take it back Carl to a bit more nuts and bolts right so we talked uh, and, and Colin touched on this around what makes up a leasing company right so, so the different fa facets within the actual um, with, within an actual leasing company itself and then can you talk to us a little bit around your role so if you are sure. head of credit risk what does that mean and what do you do sure um, okay so I mean I think Georgina touched on some of this I mean you know within aviation capital at least we we work in these um, deal team structures um, you know we have a, a sort of a deal team approach to all of the transactions that we look at but what, what makes up a deal team is all of the various disciplines within aviation capital, so all the different functions. So that's essentially how um, aircraft leasing companies uh, work, whether it's the technical function or the finance function or the marketing or trading or, or the risk function or, or pricing. Um, all of these disciplines come together, at least in aviation capital, to consider every single transaction, whether that's a... Um, a placement or, or a, a say leaseback deal and um, that, that that's essentially how we, we, we work it in in aviation capital you know um, so yeah and, and your and your day to day so so yeah. in, in liaising with your team yeah and who, who are you who do you have working for you who are you answering to within the organization sure so um, so I'm the head of the credit risk uh, function um, so I manage a team of 14 people. Um, and we, we sit in the, uh, in the operations side of um, a aviation capital alongside the technical team and the um, contract management team. And, um, we're we're all, on, all on the commercial side of the business though, you know, along with airline marketing and, and aircraft trading and, and that kind of thing. So as I said, we all, we all work very, very closely together on, a, on every single tra transaction. Um, in terms of what we actually do, so the risk function, uh, the credit risk function, we're there to assess the creditworthiness of um, of airlines uh, globally. So, you know whether it's for again for placing um, one of our, our our aircraft from our order book, or um, doing a say leaseback transaction with, with with an airline. We're the ones who will assess the creditworthiness of, of of an airline, but also the market that they operate in, the competitors that they're competing against, um, and the country that they're they're operating in as well. And, and how much more challenging has that gotten in the last two years? So, you know, we've kind of been in a general, you mentioned the cycles that are there. We were effectively in a super cycle before COVID. We'd never yeah. seen 10 years of growth, a lot of airlines uh, seeking assets. You know, Colin mentioned that long-term trend of air traffic growth. It was going extremely well. Mm -hmm. We hit an unbelievable crash. How hard 
did it then become to assess airline credit worthiness? Yeah, no, look, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say we did anything different, but, but certainly the, uh, the, the volume of work certainly increased, you know. Um, uh, yeah, look, it was, it was a, it, and it still is a challenging time, I would say, at the moment. We're not, we're not quite through COVID, um, you know, across the globe. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, assessing, you know, what's going on with the airline, we, we do a lot of, um, you know, we did a lot of customer calls because, you know, staff were grounded because of COVID. Um, and, you know, I, I guess a lot of it was just, you know, sizing up airlines, seeing what was going on with them, supporting customers wherever we could um, as well. So in that sense, it was, it certainly was a challenging time. But to the point I made earlier, um, you know, we also have, um, uh, you know, have the capabilities within aviation capital to deal with, you know, those restructuring cases or, you know, workout cases wherever we need to. Um, and, and I guess that's probably what sets us aside from some of the other players in the sector as well. Um, you know, when we, you know, when you hit a, a challenge of the scale like we did, um, you know, when, when COVID hit, um, you really need to, you know, leverage every capability across across the the business and uh, you know we were in a we were in a very good position to be able to do that you know and georgina picking up that team over whether it did or didn't how your job might have evolved right over the last couple of years and i'll give my own examples at the like i i guess what what we would do is kind of similar crossover right so we're helping clients execute transactions and we're hopefully helping them to grow and I'd say going back two years ago, we were probably helping them to survive, right? Mm -hmm. so, which was a, a, a big difference. From my own perspective, I've probably seen that shift probably in the last 12 months, maybe a little bit more, where people are moving on to the opportunity side again. Um, and we've seen significant you know, mergers and acquisitions, mm -hmm. large lessors buying other lessors. We've seen lessors being able to go out into these asset-backed securitizations, ABS, capital markets transactions. And, and it was amazing how quickly it shifted. I'd say I spent you know, six, nine months in 2010 lease restructurings, helping clients who were doing you know, debt raises to manage their liquidity position. But there's a lot more optimism out there now. We will come to maybe Russia, Ukraine in a moment. But would you have seen something similar uh, in, in your space? And, and how does the job kind of evolved over the last two years? I think very much so. We've seen something similar in, in our work. But I think what strikes me when I look back at the two and a half years of COVID and now the period we're in with, with, with Russia is the common theme through all of that. And I, I think, you know, Carl touched on it there in terms of, you know, customers in trouble and you're, you know, you're doing a lot of calls with them. Relationships, I think, are the bedrock of this industry. And I think the lessors are, you know, experts at building you know, fantastic, I think, relationships with their airline customers around the world. And that's not something that happens overnight. It's built up over years of, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, visits, interactions, you know, support in lots of different ways that happens, I think, on a daily basis when a customer has an issue and, you know, they're picking up the, the phone to their, to their, to their, their lessor. And I think th the same is true of the COVID period from my perspective and our perspective as service providers, you know, supporting the industry. The relationships that you have with people, I think, really come to the fore in, in the difficult times, you know, because there is a real you're in the trenches together and there is a bit of a, you know, a, you know, you're standing shoulder to shoulder with your with your clients. You, you understand, I think, as a service provider, what your client is trying to achieve at a business level, or at least you should. That's very important, I think, as a service provider, that you do have a very keen sense of what the business imperatives and objectives are of your client. And during COVID, I think, you know, th there was that much more kind of scrumming down together, you know, where clients and service providers, really th those deal teams that Carl mentions, they kind of moved out of the organizations as well. And I think that's, that's a real sign of, you know, a strength of a relationship that you have with, um, you know, a client in, 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 you know, in our position as a, as a law firm. Um, in terms of the day-to-day -day work, you know, like you, I think at the very start of COVID, it was, you know, that, that, that scary moment, I think, where we all did, really didn't know what was ahead of us. And, you know, you were potentially standing on the edge of a cliff, I think, you know, for a while. Um, the, the market, as you said, for lessors who were, you know, well-placed in terms of shareholder support to, you know, access and take advantage of the sale leaseback opportunities, you know, that was a very busy period as well as the restructuring. So almost straight away at the start of COVID, 
those opportunities were, were there for for certain lessors. You know, for, for other lessors, we were looking at you know some of those merger and acquisitions transactions that you mentioned. All running in the background were those ongoing, I think, um, you know, deferral, restructuring, um, you know, credit type discussions that were ongoing. But I think what struck me, you know, as the on, on the legal side was how all of the lessors really managed that with their airline customers in that very supportive, relationship-focused way, because the reality is, and we've seen this in COVID, some of those customers who were in trouble, those airline customers in particular at the start of COVID, have now you know, gone through a restructuring process and they are you know, back in a kind of a, a new co-airline or they've moved on and set up another airline. And that is, I think, back to cycles, Colm. I'm mm -hmm. sure you've seen that over the years. You know, airlines reinvent themselves. People in the industry reinvent themselves. So relationships is what it all comes back to. And I think, as I say, I think the lessors here in Ireland are, you know, extremely good at managing those relationships and making sure that they are there in a supportive capacity when, you know, when trouble hits, as, as it does, as it did in a, in a huge way during COVID. But, you know, that's happened in, in various different cycles I think over the last number of years but those same people you know are, are leading the new airlines um, you know when we come out of COVID so I think that that Joe was probably what struck me as yeah. kind of you know a, a theme that ran through you know that very challenging time and, and I think that's it and I think you talk to lessors now and they'll tell you there's been this deepening of relationships as you say a lot of airline you know we saw less airline failures uh, post COVID than we did immediately before mm. COVID mm -hmm. which you would say is bizarre but speaks to a couple of things right so we saw north of 200 billion dollars of government support going into airlines just because of how strategically important it is both from a you know trade social tourism aspect and um, what the lessors were hugely important as you say going into restructuring arrangements deferral arrangements and i think their importance in the aviation ecosystem has fundamentally increased mm -hmm. um over the course of the last two years but can i shift gears a little bit column and um, you mentioned at the outset a lot of you know your role now is, is bringing investors to the space um, and i think it's important you know we're a a very small country right we have some fabulous talented people and we talked about the tax environment that, that that makes this place work but in order to make aircraft leasing work you need to attract billions of capital um, can you talk to us a little bit about where that capital comes from and when you're chatting to them how you sell the Irish story um, it, it is certainly a, a hugely capital intensive industry and if we, if we look back at where that money has come from uh, at different times, it's come from different places. Uh, you know, Carl works for uh, you know a company owned by two very large Japanese uh, institutions, and you know, going back to when I first started in the 1980s, the Japanese were only then beginning to become a powerhouse in the industry in terms of capital. And uh, despite all the you know challenges in the meantime, they've stayed as a as a nation. They've stayed there as big supporters of the industry. They tend, as you said earlier on, Carl, to be people who will take long-term uh, positions anyway. Sure. Uh, they also understand uh, Georgina's point about um, you know, the need for strong relationships. So Japan you know, has always been, and will continue, is, is already beginning to come back into the industry after the challenges that they had. Uh, we've seen you know, significant amounts of money come from the US. Okay? Um, the physical assets that we're talking about here with their long lives are very suited to um, you know, companies that need to deploy significant capital and for long periods of time. Uh, so, for example, insurance companies are a very obvious player there. Um, you know, uh, pension funds, um, university endowments, etc. And there's huge pockets of that capital across the U.S. and across Europe. Uh, we've seen a wave of investment come from China. You know, mm -hmm. like industrial China has significant money to to deploy over the years. So we had, you know, uh, ten years when, if we were having this discussion ten years ago, Joe, we would be talking about these fledgling you know, Chinese leasing companies. Yeah. And, and now they are a very significant part of the industry. Uh, we find significant amounts of capital, and I think this is going to increase coming from uh, firms in the Middle East, um, you know, sovereign wealth funds and family wealth trusts. So it's coming from, I've talked really about geographic sources, and within that I've also tried to give some delineation between you know, are they family trusts, or are they pension companies, or are they perhaps tax investors from Japan. And we need to be vigilant and to just keep developing new products to, to make the asset, which is a great asset, more attractive to uh, investors across the globe and different types of investors. One, one change I've, I, is, has been coming and is now accelerating 
is the sheer number of people in our industry that are actually taking the product that people like Carl and his colleagues originate, okay, and then they're finding different investor groups, whether be it in the ABS transactions you mentioned earlier, be it through the Japanese tax transactions, uh, be it through you know sidecar arrangements with, with big investors. So we all have to just keep looking at our industry. You know what we have is, as you said, you know we've got tax, you know talent and track record here in Ireland, okay. But we have to make sure that we also stay in this chain between the airline and where the money is coming from. And I think we have a hugely important part to play in that. I know I've gone on a little while, but you did ask me how do I approach it actually with investors. Um, look, there's a couple of reasons why Ireland is massively important to this. Uh, you know, uh, other jurisdictions have tried to challenge us. We've seen, you know, um, the Netherlands, Singapore, Hong Kong, Tianjin, um, Le Bois, uh, and the U.S. now are coming at it as well, and we still maintain our dominant position. I think you know Hong Kong is very challenged right now for many, many reasons, obviously. But I think what we what we really have going for us here, I think, is it, there's a lot in this about the tax treaties. Okay, that gave us our that gave us our start, but that won't sustain us. What sustains us is the sheer amount of talent that there is and the commitment that we as a country have mm -hmm. to maintaining a dominant position in this industry. So it's a fairly easy sell. To investors, you know, and I deal a lot with investors in Japan and in the United States, and it's a fairly easy sell to them because they've seen how successful we've been in doing it, and they've seen that actually we can manage through all these multiple crises that have happened in, in this industry, and we've come through and come through well. So um, I, I do think it's it's as I, you know I repeat to myself now that it's a great industry, but I think our role as a country in it uh, is is very important, and I think we should nurture that and protect that going forward. We will be challenged, but we, we will prevail. And, and maybe Carl, come to you on that. Um, Colin's touched on a lot of geographies there, right? And I know in my job, um, uh, and I'm only getting back at it probably uh, after 18 months of not doing it, you're on a plane a fair bit, right? Because yes. you, you're talking to capital, um, and, and you, you need to, or you're, in my case, talking to potential investors, and you know, a lot of cases, less or is talking to airlines and customers. And it could take you very interesting places, right? So I've been in Beijing and Shanghai and Tokyo and uh, New York and, and lots of you know, interesting places that you, 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 as a student, if someone told me when I was doing accounting and finance back in DCU uh, at the turn of the century that you get to go to all these places, right, and meet interesting thing, people and, and sell Ireland, as you say, Colm, that ability to travel within the space, right? What, what have you seen that both from your kind of peers within the company and yourself? Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, it, it's it's a really really important part of uh, of you know of, certainly of my job and and you know across the functions within aviation capital. I, I was I was in Dubai in in February. I was in Mumbai and Delhi in uh, in what March. Um, you know, I'm going to be in Turkey in a couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm going to be you know, covering the US, uh, you know, North and South America in July and August. So, yeah, look, it, you know, it's one of my favorite parts of, of the job, you know, um, and it was one of the things that attracted me originally to the uh, to the industry as well, you know. So, um, you know, difficult two years with COVID and all that. There, you know, there wasn't, uh, obviously wasn't much travel, but um, yeah, it's great to, great to, you know, to be back out on the road. Really, really important though to, Certainly, again, from a risk management perspective, is get, to get out and get in front of the customers and see them, to see their, you know, their business, um, you know, their offices. There's just so much more that you pick up, mm. you know, being, you know, face to face with uh, with prospective customers, and you know, it's a really, really important part of uh, of what we do, uh, Joe. You know, so. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think those opportunities for people coming into lessors or, or working with with the ecosystem that supports it, you do get lots of opportunities, right? And to go to places meet interesting people um, and can I shift gears though slightly Georgina right um, this panel is three men one woman um, I'd say if I did a stand back and I went into a conference uh, we'd be doing well to get to 25% female right mm -hmm. so you have uh, a sector that that is male heavy um, as a senior female in the space have you seen an evolution uh, in any way, shape, or form, around you know diversity and inclusion and gender balance, and if you were talking to a female student thinking about working in the sector, and it's broadly true for a lot of financial services, what would you say to them about you know the, the inhibitors or the efforts that are being made to try and bring more balance to the space? Yeah, I was speaking personally, you know, at at, at the start, and I, I suppose I think this is relevant because it's that you know what you see is what you 
what, what you can aspire to. I think when you're a young you know, graduate or a young entrant into this industry, and I suppose I was very lucky in that I joined a firm where at the time when I joined it, um, you know, over a third of the equity partners were female, which would have been very unusual in, in the time, but that was very much what I grew up with. And I, I, th I count myself, I think, very lucky to have trained in a firm where that was very much the expectation, you know, for the, the female trainees going through as well. And, and very much a strong sense that, you know, that's something that you could be if that was what it, you were or where your ambitions lay as you went through. And even more particularly within the aviation finance group, when I started, the two heads of the group were, and still are, um, two, two female partners. So I've had a very, I think, individual experience, I think, within the industry where, you know, my mentors, the, the, the role models that I have had as, as a professional have actually been, been female. But I think you're absolutely right that once you go out into the industry, and as, as you say, we're about to brave the, the conference circuit next week and the week after, and we'll enter those conference rooms, and I think we'll be lucky if we see 25% female there, um, female representation there. Um, it's an industry where there are no, I think, natural barriers to you know senior females, whether that's in you know on the capital side, you know within the leasing companies, on any of the professional services sides. But it is striking, I think, that once you go into you know the the, the leasing sector. There are very few C-suite um, females, I think, within the you know the, the, the leasing community generally and the airline community. They're they're there, but the, the numbers are are low, and I don't have a sense that they've grown significantly. I think in the last while, so I think that is a body of work. I think for the industry to you know encourage young female talent, and I, I to be honest, I think it's very much you know you know, uh, uh, the responsibility of every individual organisation to drive that agenda internally. And it has become more important, I think, to your other question. I mean, it's a key part of the, you know, the ESG, I suppose, focus that um, that that people have in, in all sectors of society now. And that's a very strong focus, obviously, particularly on the environmental side across our industry. But the governance side, I think, you know, the G in that ESG, you know, diversity is part of that as well. And I, I think it's it's very much in the consciousness of people in the industry now. But you know, I think it's fair to say that like a lot of industries, we have a lot of work to do to push up representation, I think, particularly at the senior levels. Yeah, I think that's very fair. And you look at, you know, very positive initi initiatives like the Advancing Women in Aviation Roundtable, AWAR, you look at Propel Her, mm -hmm. and, and again, good initiatives. And, and what's important, I know I've gone to a couple of those events myself, and you are seeing senior male executives at these dinners acknowledging it's an issue, right? Because if you say, if you don't have that diversity of thought around a senior management table, you're going to miss things, right? You're not going to be as complete as you should be. Um, I'm conscious of time, but in a closing question that I wouldn't mind getting all your thoughts on, right? So we have come through um, an extremely challenging time, um, but how optimistic are you if you think about aviation finance mm. and you think about Ireland's place in it? And I'll go maybe along this line, but, but Colm, your thoughts and hopes for what the next couple of years will bring uh, for aviation finance in Ireland. Okay. Uh, I am optimistic you know, uh, about the industry and I'm optimistic that given the capabilities that we have in Ireland um, that we will continue to have a pivotal role in, in aviation development going forward. Um, I, I was pleased to see that the heading today was aviation finance and not aircraft leasing because we've, we've built so much through aircraft leasing but uh, we're also, I think, building a position in aviation finance. Like we as a country, for example, developed, in fact, uh, there's three of us in this, you, know, you at KPMG, uh, you know, uh, McCann's and GPA were involved in developing the initial ABS transactions. We have to keep to the forefront of things like that in terms of finding, the, that's what I was saying earlier on, finding the new investors, developing the structures that are necessary to bring those new investors in. I'm very optimistic that we can do that, but it, I think we should broaden our thinking and not just think about how the aircraft are leased, okay? but think about how the industry is financed. And I think that we've been through the first you know, 
30 or 40 years of it. Let's think through the next 50 years of it and take a very long-term view. But I'm very optimistic about it, Joe. Yeah, well, 50 years will see me out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it will see me out as well. Your thoughts around that, Georgina? I'd absolutely share that mm. optimism. I mean, I think, you know, pulling together a lot of the things we've talked about, it is a very collaborative industry. I think, you know, conference week that, that we've mentioned and, and when you're abroad, it always strikes me that no matter who you work for, there is very much, uh, you know, an Ireland Inc. focus to the approach that everyone in the industry takes. I think staying relevant, which is probably your point, Colm, is hugely important to us. And I, I don't think there is complacency within the industry. It can happen when you're in the, you know, the driving seat as, as Ireland is. And I think that's the really important piece that we're looking at as you say, not just at leasing. I think at the you know the technical side, making sure that we have the throughput of you know engineers coming through, which mm -hmm. you know we used to be leaders more, in, and yeah. I think that that's an area we need mm -hmm. to look at. The the ESG side of things, I think that is going to be hugely important for our industry in the next ten years. And I'd like to see you know and, and you know the leasing companies certainly are taking very much a, a leadership position on that here. So I think it's about staying relevant, making sure that we are looking at all aspects of the industry not just not just leasing not just financing and making sure uh, you know as a community and as a business community we're developing all of those strands you know at the same time but very optimistic i think as to where that the, the place of the industry in ireland out into the future carol your thoughts yeah i would i would absolutely echo that um you know it's not it's not something not something that i'm overly concerned with um at all i, I think we have a very very strong position um, but it is about maintaining that. It is about um, not, you know, getting complacent and hubris not setting in. That's absolutely not the case. I, I think across the industry, you, 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 we continue to see um, companies, you know, continuing to to build upon what you know the position that, that they have and to continue to move with the times across all aspects of of business. So, you know, I think as long as you know that you know that sort of mentality remains at the forefront. Um, you know, I think we, I, I think um, the industry remains on, on on a very solid footing. I would say for the coming years. You know, yeah. and, and I might just make one quick point yeah. as well, just on on a previous question, um, in relation to gender diversity. Um, so, aviation capital actually was w one of the most recent signatories to the IATA twenty five by twenty twenty five initiative, which. Um, seeks to promote gender um, diversity across aviation as well. So um, I'm the uh, co-sponsor in aviation capital for, um, for that initiative. So I just wanted to, um, to, to, to touch on that, along with my colleague, um, Elaine Collins, who's the head of information and technology in aviation capital. And, and so. you've just appointed a female CFO, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Yes, yes, uh, actually, Kenny. Which, which was really great to see. Um, I'd echo those optimistic thoughts. If I was a young person coming at aviation now, there's a couple of fundamental factors I'd come back to. Um, people want to travel. Um, that's clear. A recovery is evident. I think leasing's importance within um, the ecosphere of aviation has just increased and, and will continue to be very, very important. And I think Ireland's place at the centre of that world is very, very strong. Um, and I would like to commend Matthew and the team here at IASA because we talked about that talent aspect and it is bringing through a generation of talent to keep it going and grow it. But it is a hugely enjoyable, uh, as Colm said, and can be very remunerative as a career. Um, and I would uh, wholeheartedly recommend that those that are thinking about the space do look to it, do talk to people. I hope you've enjoyed the chat so far today. I'd like to thank all the panellists for what was, I think, a really interesting uh, and enjoyable conversation and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, if there was a crowd here, they would have been silent the whole time because it was very interesting. Um, the, love the flow of it. And as all of you mentioned, very optimistic for the future. And hopefully a couple of our audience at home can maybe take your place in the 50 years that you say you might be, you know, stepping down in. <laughs> But um, really glad that panel went on, it breezed through. And I'd just like to introduce our next, next guest. Um, we have Aer Lingus's Chief of Strategy, Reid Moody, who will take us through how to future-proof an airline, especially Aer Lingus. Hello, everybody. Um, many thanks um, to Matthew and the committee and all of you for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Um, it's a real privilege. Uh, to be speaking to the uh, future of aviation in Ireland uh, and potentially across the world. 
Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, Aer Lingus today specifically, um, about where we were previous to COVID, what happened during COVID, and basically how we're trying to set ourselves up uh, for the recovery. Um, first of all, a little bit of an introduction on me. So my name's Reid Moody. Um, I'm a chartered accountant by uh, trade. Um, I've been at Aer Lingus now for six years. Um, I'm currently the chief strategy and planning officer. So my kind of portfolio would include a uh, long-term uh, network plan, um, the shorter um, schedule. So we would look at uh, the upcoming summer schedule and the um, upcoming winter schedule. Um, we also have all of the partners, the alliances, uh, the franchises within my team uh, and fleet as well. So long term uh, decisions to be made on uh, which aircraft, how many, where we're going to fly them. Um, and I also look after some of the revenue management as well. So um, that was brought into my portfolio in the last 12 months uh, as part of um, the response to COVID, uh, just so that we can try and marry up um, how we deal with revenue uh, and capacity uh, while we're trying to recover through um, the pandemic. Um, previous to uh, my current role, uh, I was finance director at Aer Lingus, so a kind of group financial control function, looking at pretty much the whole business. Um, and then before that, um, I actually started um, my aviation career with uh, British Airways, so joined British Airways back way back in 2008 um, in the finance team. So uh, did a lot of internal audits, uh, moved on to the trading um, desks in Treasury, uh, looking at jet fuel, uh, looking at interest rates and looking at uh, foreign exchange uh, and then moved into a financial controller role in the engineering department uh, within BA. So um, all of the finances to do with the maintenance um, of the British Airways fleet. So that's my history. Um, first of all, I am going to take you through a little bit of um, where Engl Aer Lingus was uh, before the pandemic started, uh, when, the, when the times were good. So um, to take you back in time, uh, 2019, 2018, 2017 um, were all very good years for Aer Lingus. We had uh, significant growth. Um, if you think where Aer Lingus was in 2019 versus even five or six years previous, um, we had increased um, the overall capacity of the business by 100%, so doubled um, the overall capacity. Uh, we had five or six uh, transatlantic routes, uh, and that incre increased to over 13 routes in 2019. Um, we were basically um, doing really well on our strategy, uh, which was to turn Dublin uh, into a Dublin hub, uh, a key connector between um, Europe and the UK, and North America. And the strategy was going really well. As I said, uh, more than doubled our capacity. Um, we had strong financial results. Um, those results we needed to have um, because uh, we needed to be uh, cognizant that we have to reinvest in the business and new fleet. Um, new fleet as well um, is mentioned there on the slide. And that's really exciting. Uh, because back in 2016, 2017, uh, we had ordered um, some of the first uh, transatlantic narrow bodies. So you may be aware of the Airbus A321 long range um, and then the subsequent uh, model, the XLR, the extra long range. So Aer Lingus was one of the first um, airlines to uh, order those units. And in fact, the majority of um, the uh, long range aircraft we have narrow bodies in the fleet at the minute. The majority of them were delivered through uh, throughout the COVID period. So we've not really been able to fly them as much as we would have uh, previously liked. But that's all set to change now as we start to rebuild the business. So as I say there, the, the ambition was really, really grand uh, and it was being executed really well. Um, you can see there um, from an Ireland point to point perspective, we had over 60% share of Irish uh, North American seats on an overall European North, uh, North Atlantic uh, measure, we had about 3% uh, percent of uh, seats. Um, our future strategy is basically to continue this 
Um, and we want to get back to growth as soon as possible. So I'll come on to that in a few seconds time, but basically getting our um, historic network back in place and then looking to exploit further growth opportunities. Um, so we don't want to stop at 13 or 14 uh, destinations in the US. Uh, we want to take that up um, each year over the next few years. The other key thing that happened during COVID, so not previous to COVID, but it's worth mentioning because it's on this slide, is we actually uh, started uh, a new base in Manchester as well, uh, long haul operations. Um, that was as a result of uh, market opportunity that we saw. So uh, the reduction in Thomas Cook and um, Virgin flying from Manchester uh, meant that we thought there was an opportunity to fill uh, that capacity gap. Um, and we had a huge project, took basically um, every department within Aer Lingus, uh, from flight ops through to engineering, through to legal, through to finance, through to planning, through to everything in between um, to set up the new AOC, so aircraft operating certificate. So we've now got uh, an Irish AOC, where the vast majority of the flying operates out of, and we also have a UK AOC um, operating in Manchester. And at the minute, uh, serving Orlando, um, Barbados, and New York. Uh, so that's really exciting. And again, if that goes well, we would look to grow that in the future and who knows what's beyond. One of the key things that we are um, basically uh, really confident and happy about is the ability for people to uh, transfer uh, through Dublin in a really, really efficient way. So Dublin being one of the key English speaking cities now, especially now that um, the UK has left um, Europe, um, we think that the um, strategy for Dublin to become a key hub is only increased. Uh, we also think it's very good in terms of security. So what I mean by that is where it's positioned. Um, Dublin is one of the most efficient hubs within Europe. Um, if you travel to Frankfurt or even Amsterdam, for a lot of Western Europe, you actually have to backhaul on yourself. So we actually think that Dublin gives um, sustainability and environmental uh, benefits as well. If you transfer through Dublin, uh, rather than having to backtrack on yourself, if you go over towards um, Germany. Um, so that's it. That's where we were. Then all of a sudden, kind of disaster happened. Now this graph looks um, pretty detailed, but it's not. Um, basically, on the right hand side, shows a graph of capacity, um, 2019 through to the end of this year, 2022, uh, and then the two COVID years in between. So first of all, Aer Lingus is a seasonal business. You can see that in a good year, 2019 being an example of that, we operate about twice as much capacity in the summertime as we do in the um, off-peak season. Um, and that's all the leisure and visiting friends and relatives travel that you would expect. Um, decent load factors in the summer peak especially. Then all of a sudden back in February, March time, 2020, you can see the load factor, the, the purple uh, dotted line just completely fall off a cliff. Um, the green uh, bar chart then shows capacity and it basically shows that overnight our capacity went to zero and pretty much stayed there for nearly two years. Um, Ireland was hit harder than any other European nation. Um, and in certain indices, it was probably in the top 10 of most affected um, countries in the world for travel restrictions. So unlike our sister companies like British Airways and especially Iberia and Welling, which did have the ability to have domestic travel and did have the ability to have um, travel during the summertime um, in both 2020 and especially 2021, um, the travel restrictions remained in Ireland, both on a European travel uh, basis and um, across the Atlantic to the US, right through to the very end of the summer 2021. So it wasn't really until June, July, August, September time last year that we were able to start thinking about rebuilding um, our uh, network. Um, and it did start to build. You can see there on the graph, um, September, November, time last year we put capacity in and the load factors responded to that then all of a sudden you can see the load factor around christmas time last year drop off significantly again and that was the uh, omicron so um, another kind of blow to us um, just as we thought we were getting back on our feet um, and that really dented um, people's confidence um, over christmas 
Um, since then, we are 100% um, focused on recovery. So uh, you can see there that our plans are to get back upwards of 90% of um, historic capacity this year um, and have load factors to match. So that is by far the biggest focus of the business at the minute, making sure that we have a solid operation. Um, what we have out there on the website and in our schedule, we are able to fly. And you'll probably be aware at the minute, there's um, a lot of headaches and problems um, within um, airports, within airlines on being able to resource um, and have enough um, operational resilience to actually fly. Um, it's a key story that we've seen across the globe over the last number of weeks. Um, so from an airline's perspective, we're 100% focused on making sure that we have a strong and stable operation this summer because we want to give as much confidence to the traveling public um, that what we say we will fly, we definitely will fly. So that's a key thing for us. But during the COVID period, I've just got a few bullets there to take you through. Um, by far the key thing, once we realized that this was an extremely serious situation was to focus on uh, maintaining our cash and minimizing um, cash losses as much as possible. Now that's very difficult to do within an airline because there's so much of our business that's a fixed cost. We have to keep paying for um, salaries, even though a lot of the workforce took um, salary reductions. Um, we have to keep paying for um, aircraft, even though we were able to get some um, deferments uh, and holidays and some of the rentals on our leased fleet. Um, we still have to pay for a lot of maintenance. We still have to pay for um, a lot of the general overhead. So minimizing cash to zero is impossible, but where we tried um, where it was possible, we tried to do so. Uh, one of the key things that we did with the fleet, because obviously we weren't really flying at all, was to ground the fleet. Uh, but even when it's grounded, it needs to be um, heavily maintained. Um, but where possible, we tried to park the aircraft uh, in places that would minimize any kind of corrosion um, and have maintenance programs in place. And then, as I, as I mentioned at the start, we had to massively cut capacity uh, and that had huge headaches as well. There were tens of thousands of people booked to travel in um, springtime and summertime 2020 that all of a sudden had their flights cancelled. And our call centres and our IT systems are just not set up for that scale of a challenge in terms of uh, refunds or rebooking. So that was a massive, massive project that we had to put in place um, to try and have a 24-hour day, seven-day-the-week operation that we could contact customers and have processes in place uh, to refund and reaccommodate. Um, and that's still going on to this day. And it's one of the areas that we're going to focus on in the future, actually. So we'll come on to that as well. But that was the COVID years. Um, and then, as I say, the regrowth is not without its challenges. So we have to balance um, the kind of demand uh, forecast with um, slot protection. So during the two years of COVID, we had full alleviation on the vast majority of our slots. Uh, that's no longer in place. Uh, in the UK, for our UK flying, we have to fly at least 70% of our slots. In Europe, it's slightly less, about 65%, but it's still significant. So we have to make sure that for the long term, um, where we want to get back to, we protect those slots um, and balance uh, the amount of flying we do to them with the demand scenario as well. So juggling all these things is basically what uh, my team and the operational teams um, are doing every single day at the minute, making sure we have a resilient operation and making sure that um, the flying network and schedule we have out there um, meets our expectations with regard to demand, with regard to um, how much we can resource and with regard to um, slot protection as well. So hopefully um, we have now turned the, the, the corner uh, and we are definitely in uh, green shoots and recovery mode. Um, we've had a good Easter and bookings for the summertime uh, look positive. Um, so a lot of the longer term thinking now has turned uh, to how we kind of future proof ourselves uh, for the next two, three, four, five years. And you can see here, there's kind of six areas um, I've um, put up on the screen. And I'll just talk through each one of them in turn. 
So on a network, so this is very close to my heart, uh, my side of the business, uh, we're very aware that the traveling public haven't really traveled at all in the last two years. Uh, there's still confusion maybe in, um, with respect to what testing requirements are in place in some countries. Um, so one of the key things we want to do is give confidence back to the traveling public. Um, and what I mean by that is make sure that what we offer them we definitely fly. There'll be no um, late cancellations. Uh, we'll have good communications and call center uh, and have a good app and website um, stability. So that all adds to the confidence and hopefully encourages uh, people to get back into the skies. Um, once we get people confident, we want to, as soon as possible, get our previous network back, plus Manchester, um, which is exciting and new. Uh, but we want to get back to a place where we were in 2018 and 2019. Um, and as I say, we have um, pretty big ambitions with that. Um, by the end of this year, we'll be at 90% plus of what we flew back in 2019. Um, then it's looking to the kind of medium term, um, and that's future growth. And right back to my first slide, if you remember, um, our future growth is still focused on maximizing Dublin's ability to be a hub into um, Europe uh, and the US. Um, so we have taken on eight of those new long range narrow body aircraft uh, from 2023. So next year, we'll start to get deliveries of a further six um, XLRs. So um, our fleet continues to grow um, and our network team at the minute is fully engaged in trying to figure out where is the best place to fly those um, new units to. So are we looking at uh, increasing frequency um, to the core Boston's and JFK's? Are we looking at new cities um, on the East Coast and within LR and XLR range? Those are all the kind of questions we're asking ourselves at the minute. So that's good to be back in that kind of frame of mind rather than cutting capacity um, and canceling hundreds of flights. Um, it's brilliant to be looking at 2023 and beyond and seeing where we think there is potential for um, new flying. If we move on to the next box, which is the partners and alliances, we've done a huge amount actually during COVID. So one of the key things a lot of people say to me is um, it must have been really quiet, quiet for the last couple of years. It's been the opposite. We've been so busy trying to keep um, the minimal operation stable um, trying to keep up with all the cancellations, the replanning, the reforecasting, minimizing minimizing cash burn, all that kind of stuff. But we've also been very busy busy with um, partners and alliances as well. So a lot of you might be aware that um, our franchise partner Stobart Air um, went out of business during the COVID period. Um, so we were extremely busy uh, putting out a tender to other interested parties. Uh, of which Emerald Airlines was successful. So a lot of the last two years has basically been spent um, trying to uh, recover uh, what happened um, in the aftermath of um, the Stobart business going uh, bust. And then secondly, um, putting together all the contracts, all the operational plans um, for Emerald to get um, live uh, with their operation which I'm pleased to say they have done extremely successfully. So over the last couple of months, um, they've commenced their operations uh, and will continue to increase capacity um, over the course of the summer. So we're really excited about that because um, it adds a huge amount of extra flow and connections uh, into Dublin uh, from the UK regions um, that we can then uh, push through onto our US network. Um, we're also busy with the um, joint business. Um, some of you are probably uh, aware of that. Uh, the IAG group, which is ourselves, British Airways, Iberia, of Welling, Level, um, has a joint business with um, American and Finnair. And we look to um, maximize and coordinate our flying and our services and our customer experience across the um, Atlantic. We got um, anti-trust immunity uh, granted during COVID. So we've been very busy from an operational and IT perspective, trying to integrate a lot of our systems so that they work well with the other carriers that are involved in the Atlantic joint business. We're also good partners with JetBlue uh, and we continue to be so. 
Um, so we've been trying to further our partnership and opportunities um, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, JetBlue being able to code onto our network into Europe and us further coding uh, with them onto their um, US domestic network as well. Um, Again, further opportunities within the group itself. So what other distribution methods and what maximization um, efficiencies we can make with um, British Airways, with Iberia, with Welling, um, a team uh, within the building here have been looking very closely like that, at that. And then also anything else. So what we can see right across the globe in terms of uh, code share partners that are a good fit with the Aer Lingus brand. Uh, cost base, as you would expect, uh, back to that cash is king piece has been a key focus and it will continue to be. So we have a transformation program in place that will look to deliver over the next couple of years to try and get us back onto a cost base footing um, that enables us to invest in the future. And it's key that we have a competitive cost base uh, so that we have decent profits um, that we can um, invest a new fleet, um, both on the short haul side and then in the future um, the refleet of the wide body long haul aircraft as well. So cost based efficiencies uh, and productivity um, is a key uh, part of our plan at the minute. Uh, digital is also key. Um, the world is becoming more and more digitally focused. As you're all aware, you'll all be much more digitally capable than I am. Um, but one of the uh, key things that we want to do is make sure that any part of your journey, uh, whether it's during the booking uh, phase of the journey whether it's during the kind of check-in or whether you want to change any of your details. Um, we want all of those bits to be able to be done, managed and serviced either on the website or on the app. Now, at the minute, um, the Aer Lingus um, app and website is good, but we think it could be better, um, especially in times of disruption. Um, the ability to very easily uh, change your flight, refund, rebook, uh, get a voucher, those kind of things. Um, that was an extremely difficult process during COVID. Uh, a lot of it had to go through the call center. Uh, we want to be able to automate that and put IT solutions in place so that um, it means it's scalable if there is any of this kind of um, size of um, difficulties in the future, uh, but also is um, less, less, less pressure on the call center. Um, we also want to improve the call center, so the ability to have um, robotics in there that um, easily deals with simple queries uh, that leaves the uh, really technical expert um, call center operatives to deal with the more difficult queries. Um, that's a much more efficient use of their time. On the brand, um, again, a lot of you have seen in the air and around the airport, um, Aer Lingus uh, did a rebranding exercise back in 2019, um, and we uh, want to continue doing that. So finish off all of the repaints of delivery, uh, finish off all of the uniform exercises, and then finalize uh, what we want to do in, uh, with regard to the brand from a marketing perspective to the rest of the world uh, and show what we want to be as a company for the future. Um, the final bit is key for us. So sustainability um, is the one thing that um, never really escaped us uh, and was always front of our minds during COVID is that the world and the focus on sustainability and especially within um, aviation is becoming more and more important. So it's core to everything that we do. Uh, we have a huge amount of sustainability discussions. There's a sustainability uh, committee uh, set up within the business now. Uh, we work very, very closely with IAG on um, all of the sustainability programs that they look at. We work um, hand in hand with British Airways. Uh, at the minute, we are working very closely with them on the potential for um, sustainable aviation fuel, where we can source that, um, how those contracts uh, and supply chains are structured. So that's one of the key things for us is the ability to have... Um, confidence in getting secure uh, supply chains for sustainable uh, aviation fuel. The other bit is the refleet. So those XLRs and um, LR A321s um, are all 15 to 20% more fuel efficient and 30% more noise efficient uh, than the uh, older generation aircraft that they, they replace. So we're aware that um, we need to refleet if we want to lower our um, cost of carbon units. Um, and then finally, um, other things around the side, so 
doesn't um, directly um, be the aircraft or the fuel, but there's other things that go on the aircraft that we have to change. So uh, onboard plastics and reusable plastics, um, we want to get rid of those. And I'm glad to say that over the last couple of weeks, um, all the plastics on board are now being replaced um, with uh, wooden um, and sustainable alternatives. Uh, and then finally on the ground uh, in the future, we want all of our ground fleets, so all of the tugs, all of the vehicles that we use to be electrified um, and have 100% um, renewable electricity feeding that electric fleet. Um, and then looking also at our buildings, um, the ability to have 100% um, renewable electricity feeding all of our utilities, um, solar power on the hangar roof um, potential, all of those kind of things are things that we're looking at. So that is it from me in a nutshell. I hope that was very useful. Just taking you through a little bit of where we were, um, where um, COVID uh, impacted us, um, and how we're trying to get the recovery underway and give uh, confidence to the traveling public. And then the key kind of five or six areas that we're focused on for the future on how we uh, rebuild uh, and future-proof Aer, Aer, Aer Lingus for uh, the next generation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reid. Um, very interesting the discussion on Aer Lingus' future and future-proofing an airline. I will now hand you back over to Josh for our second interview of the day. Uh, Josh will be talking to Victor Coslo, the founder of the Global Flight Training Solutions in Florida, and uh, it's sure to be a very interesting conversation. up we have an interview with Victor Costello of Global Flight Training Solutions and Victor is also a former Leinster and Irish rugby player and Irish Olympian and Ryanair captain so Victor it's great to have you with us this year at our uh, symposium thank you so much for joining us thanks for having me Josh it's great to be here great so so let's get stuck in so Victor if you can tell us a bit about your career in aviation obviously you've got a pretty uh, extensive career outside of aviation but uh, maybe if you can talk to us a little bit of how you got into aviation and um, any of the highlights along along the way. Sure. Um, well, how I got into aviation was quite simple. Uh, as a young fella, I was playing international sport and so therefore traveling a lot. And every weekend we traveled to matches and events and so on. And while this was tiring, I was the person, I found myself being the person on the aisle seat because obviously I'm six foot five but I was always doing this, you know, leaning down or, or the other way to see what was going on in the flight deck, you know. And I guess back then, and, and I know things have changed since, but all those mystery dials, you always had this idea that there was a lot of maths and physics that would be a barrier to anyone like me getting into the flight deck. But it still mesmerized me. And I always said, you know, God, it'd be great to fly this aircraft. And then I looked poorly at friends of mine and colleagues that just didn't care. They were able to read their books or, you know, write their notes. And they just got on this bit of, you know, tubular tin and flew to whatever destination. So I wanted to know how it all works. They were happy just to sit there and have their coffee. And I guess that was the intrigue. Um, apart from that, professional sport doesn't last forever. So you need a career change. And that's what started. Um, that was what started me into aviation. And I took my first lesson out in Western Airport in the early noughties. And, you know, there's, it's, we all know how hard it is to get through training and to get into airlines and so on. But I guess, I guess the most satisfying part of my training, because you're always training, even though you get through the initial part and then into the airlines, you're always at a recurrent training or continuous training. I think the most satisfying part of aviation is the command upgrade. It's when the airline gives you, you know, all of the responsibility and all of the trust to manage the two or 300 people in the back, plus the people on the ground, plus crew and so on. And I think that was a really, really great part of my aviation career was the command upgrade and becoming a captain. Um, you know, from then on, it, 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 you kind of view things in a different light. Um, and up to that stage, you're always hoping to achieve captaincy and you wonder and you doubt like everything else in any sort of progression of career. So definitely the command upgrade was the highlight of, of the training in my airline career. Fantastic. And then obviously now you're not flying um, in the command seat uh, these days. You're, you're 
working on global flight training solutions. So can you tell us a bit about how that came about and what the transition was like from, from the flight deck to flight school? Yeah, so basically any, I guess, airline pilot or will tell you or anyone who's actually taken up active flying at any level will tell you that always they always come across people who ask you, oh, how do I become a pilot? And how the question how I become a pilot has changed so much in the last couple of decades, mm-hmm. certainly when I was a kid. Um, and the problem I found was if you ask five different pilots how to become a pilot, you'll get five different routes. And then you'll get advice on this route. And then you'll always go down a rabbit hole of regulation. So I tried to simplify this to anyone who asked me. And then I ended up kind of somewhat mentoring. And then I had the opportunity to open a flight school and do the flight training the way I did it. Uh, and then, of course, improve. Because any pilot will tell you, well, I should have probably spent more time on this or I could have done the ATPL license faster. So I kind of tailored what I should have done in my flight training and produced it in Global Flight Training Solutions. So we went right the way back down to flying little Cessnas. Um, so I'm not flying 737 as often. And do I miss it? Absolutely. Of course you miss it. Uh, I will be back soon because we've moved back as a family back to Ireland. So I will be based back here. And you know, with this impending pilot shortage, I'll try and get back in, in the left-hand seat. But for the moment, that's how we open the flight school, to provide opportunity for pilots of all ages to get into a career in the most efficient manner. Great. And then and at GFTS, um, what aircraft do you have and what, what do you offer for students and, and what are the facilities like there? Well, what we offer mainly, uh, as discussed earlier off air, is, uh, you know, the weather in Florida. You know, so we all, I went out to Weston in the early noughties and at the time I was playing professional rugby and I'd go out and I'd come back at my friends and colleagues and say, how did you get on? I'd be, oh, it was great. I did a stall and in actual fact, I was lying to them. I just wanted to save face. So what we have in Florida is the weather for a start, 365 days of the year. We've got two very good and long runways We've got no landing fees, no takeoff fees, no touch and go fees, and no ancillary costs. And we've got very good aircraft and we've got very good aircraft availability. The reason we've got the availability is because we schedule students in the aircraft. It's not just a case of first come, first serve. And if you come out, there might be an aircraft there or it might be available or it might be in maintenance. We schedule it. So we've, we've, we've learned this the hard way, by the way. This isn't just something we produce. But for students coming out to Florida, we want to make sure that their time is used efficiently. Um, Years ago, anyone coming out to the US, they wouldn't have the kind of, I guess, Irish or European hook there to make sure they're looked after. Whereas we provide that. We make sure they come over, they get their training done, and they effectively don't leave till they get what they need to achieve. Normally, you know, in maintenance terms, we can turn an aircraft around for parts in a day. So that's not an issue. If there's a weather issue, it's normally clear the next day. Uh, that's the way Florida is. So we, we basically provide a platform to, to, for students to get to where they need to get to. Um, with all of that kind of mix of, of the general aviation of America, but also the highly regulated part of the UK, Ireland and Europe. So we, we, we believe we've got the blend right, but we're constantly working to, to make it better. Absolutely. And constantly working to make it better. You're um, constantly improving and, and innovating. Um, what's what's unique about what you offer to your students and how how has that evolved and how have you had to innovate in order to, to offer that? Yeah, well, well, I guess what we find, people often ask, ask us, there's lots of flight schools in Florida, you know, what makes you different? And I guess what makes us different, Josh, is that we like to think that we train airline pilots. Um, how we train airline pilots is we kind of structure the training that a student might do, whether it's our building, private license, instrument or commercial, like an airline. So we kind of roster days on, roster days off. So we manage their fatigue levels, but we also manage them you know, to make sure they're performing at the level they should be while they're in Florida. So we give them task-based stuff. So in the hour building, which is normally a mystery, you know, because people just go off and fly around in circles, be it in Ireland or the UK or Florida, we make it task-based. And you can do that in Florida. For example, in Ireland here, you wouldn't be able to really fly into Dublin airspace, you know, because there's going to be international traffic. In Florida, you can. You're looked after. You go on flight following. Now, that's not something we encourage until the student is ready to do it. But we make sure the student gets the experience of flying into congested airways so they get used to different ATC in their ears. And that all 
helps going to the next step of their training, particularly your modular students. So when you go into an airline, you're flying. If you take your going east from Dublin, you're going into UK airspace, which are arguably the best in the world. You're going then into Maastricht, you know, into Netherlands, all through Rhine in Germany, French, Spain. And people will say, not me, that it deteriorates the more south you go. Right? So we try and get students to get that, you know, experience of, you know, American ATC coming from what they've left to be in an Ireland in a club scenario or in the UK in a club scenario or a flight school scenario where you're pretty much going the same routes all the time. That's what we offer, offer differently. Obviously, we, we, we do it cost effective. And I, I think one of our most recent improvements was, I know we spoke to you about it before, was our dual licensing. We believe this is going to be a, a pretty hefty pilot shortage on the horizon. We see, we've seen it in the US already in the last year. The US domestic travel probably was a year ahead of what the, what the recovery is here after the pandemic. But we see a great benefit of switching jurisdictions. So what we provide at Global Flight Train Solutions is the dual licensing. You come over to train with us, you get both an FA license and an EASA license. That will give a student the benefit of being able, the ability to be hired across the globe in due course. So if you go back to what I originally said to you about what we feel are we're unique, we like to think that we bring a student into train and we're with them for life because if they get the dual licensing, we'll, we'll always be ahead of their next stage of their career. As we train them in, as a private license, we get them prepared for their hour building. As we train them through our building, we get them ready for their IR and commercial multi, and then of course the multi-crew coordination course, the MCC. Like when you're flying an aircraft, you know, older people will tell you, keep ahead of the aircraft. So while you're flying a Cessna, you know, at low speeds, you got to keep ahead of what's going to happen next, or you're flying a 737 or an Airbus at higher speeds. You always got to keep it with the, ahead of the aircraft. And we try and keep ahead of every stage of our students' career. So eventually we're going to go into um, pilot recruitment. Uh, the fact we're based on the East Coast of America, we're, you know, and we're a European-owned flight school, we see there's going to be a benefit of pilots moving across the world. It was, it was, it was like this in about 2017, and of course, a couple of years later, the pandemic hit. So I guess, again, our unique part is that we look after pilots for life. Um, you know, not just when they leave us, we get them prepared for line training, get them prepared for their type rating and command upgrade. As I said to you at the start, the command upgrade was the most satisfying part of my career. So I want to help people along in their career. Absolutely. And you touched on there students from, from Ireland and from the UK. Um, are your students coming from all over Europe and America? And what are they saying about their experience? With you? Yeah, well, we have a um, very good question. I mean, basically, any student that's come up, we were initially in our building uh, facility because we, we didn't get the uh, accreditation to train non-US citizens, which was a, a situation that derived from 2001, 9-11. So we recently got that accreditation. So prior to that accreditation, we could only do our building. And every our builder we have had looks like they're, it looks like they're coming back to us for the full training. So that is a testimonial in itself. And we're now churning out testimonials to students that are acquiring to us. So we get a lot of interest. There was, there was obviously the pandemic and there was bad sentiment on the US in, the, in ever since the 2016 election. Um, and that was changed in 2020. And of course, the pandemic. But people are getting more confident in traveling these days. So we're getting a lot of interest in Europe. However, we do have a decent amount of local traffic. And, you know, we're looking at the Asian market as well. And than Mauritius Islands, et cetera. So we're getting really a lot of interest from, from around the world. And again, a lot of that's got to do with the dual licensing, um, providing the FA and the asset through our partners over here in Europe. And my job basically at the moment is, is those relationships being back here in Europe, which is great, meeting people face to face as opposed to on a Zoom, you know, during the pandemic. Absolutely. And how is fly training evolving to meet the current demands of the industry and, and airlines and, and what are you um, doing with GFTS to, to meet those demands and to innovate in order to stay competitive? Um, I think, I think the confidence is coming back in, into the market, into the training market. I think during the pandemic, everyone was scared and 
any dog in the street would tell you to stay away from aviation or oh, aviation is in trouble. And of course, in my lifetime in aviation, we've had a financial crisis. We've had 9-11. We've had a volcano that caused an issue. And then we had a pandemic. And, you know, you have much more expert, expert, many more experts than me to tell you about aviation, but it's a very resilient industry. So if you look now, for example, I think airlines have adapted over the years, integrated courses from recognized traditional flight schools uh, were always required in, I guess, the flagship airlines. Whereas now it's gone, gone to the modular route because we believe that modular pilots provide more ambition, provide more gumption, more, more you know, are goal-driven, um, are success-driven, and that provides better captains. So we see the, the industry adapting to, you know, people who maybe have a career change, you know, and they want to become pilots at different ages. It's not all about teenagers or 20-year-olds. It's now 40, maybe even late 40-year-olds going into the game. So, you know, and, and airlines are adapting that because of the shortage. Um, how we're adapting to that is, is we, we've got great capacity. So I guess one of the greatest things we've had from the start, a legacy from the start, as, as an Irish-owned flight school in Florida, is that we've had a great relationship with the county. If you go to most airfields, um, flight training airfields around Europe, UK and Ireland, mainly you get a lot of resident problems, you get noise problems, you know, county council problems. I'm not saying everywhere, but you got one of those big three. Uh, we have none of that, you know, touch wood. We have a great relationship and that relationship gives us capacity. We've got two, two 5,000 run, uh, feet runways. One's about to be extended to 7,000. One has been recently resurfaced to the tune of $10 million by the county. And we have no noise, no curfews. And as I mentioned before, no ancillary costs. So in a lot of ways, we've got a capacity to be able to take more and more students from different parts of the globe. And that's how we see the future is getting people trained and getting people trained quickly. Because as I said, and I know I said this to you personally, Josh, we see a really bad pilot shortage happening. And we're trying to brace ourselves for that and make sure we're able to grasp the opportunity that provides. Absolutely. So you've touched on the expansion of the, the runways where you are and the pilot shortage. More students will be um, coming into flight training. What are the future plans for yourselves um, with Global Flight Training Solutions? Are, is it going to be um, additional aircraft and additional um, people and infrastructure or what does the future look like for you? Yeah, we have these calls uh, every month uh, with, with our staff and our general manager about how we grow. And, you know, coming back, as you mentioned, I was at Ryanair for uh, eight years. And prior to that, I played professional sport. So I go from one kind of glamorous uh, area or industry into a really rugged, robust company. And that company has given me much, a lot of, a lot of interesting uh, DNA, let's put it that way. So we derive from that experience I've had, um, you know, we share that experience with the Americans on the ground. So our, we, we're very much low cost. We've got a really low cost base over there, uh, but we've also got 1400 acres. So we, we you know, we want to get to the stage. We've got five aircraft now moving on to six. We want to get to the stage where we have 10 and then on to 20. And um, we own all our aircraft outright no leases or anything like that so we run our own show the difficulty is the more aircraft the more hangar space so we've got to grow our hangar space and our classroom space with those aircraft and with that capacity obviously purchasing an aircraft albeit hard these days because of the competition it's easy to do building hangar is not that easy however in america with can do attitude we can get a hangar permitting which you would call planning permission over here and a, site, a parcel of land, which you call site, authorized and accredited within probably three to six month period. So we have that capacity to grow. We obviously don't grow before we, we, we need to, but we see a very good future. We're very ambitious. We want to be the greatest, biggest and best Irish flight school there is. But we're also very aware of our partners in Ireland and how it's a small industry. And we want to respect them as well. And, and every you know European that comes over to us. So managing where we want to go by taking care of where we are is very hard to do, as you can say, as you can understand. Also from two different com continents. But so far we've done it, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. 
Absolutely. Well, Victor, it sounds like the future is, is bright and hopefully it's a, a busy one for you. Um, it's been great talking to you. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but uh, we look forward to uh, having you on again and hearing how um, things develop with you over in, in Florida. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you for having me and best luck. Thank you, Josh. So great to hear from Victor there. And uh, thanks once again, Josh, for asking the right questions. So we will be uh, cutting now for a short break. And um, we will be back at half one. Um, so you can prepare yourself a cup of tea, a bit of lunch, and then we have some incredible speakers after that you can see on the agenda now. We will also be giving out um, the vouchers, so some immediately after the break and then some at the end of the day. So see you then.
your trusted aviation partner. Insurance. We offer a crewing database that provides swift access to top tier pilots who are type rated and current on today's most widely used commercial and private jets. Flight operations can be extremely complex, but our experienced team are experts at adapting quickly to last minute changes and unforeseen scenarios. No matter your requirements, one thing remains constant our commitment to keeping your critical flight operations on track. Six West, your trusted aviation partner.
Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Mic check, mic check. You'll have to forgive me, sorry, I'm, I'm a li little bit down. Hi, how you doing? I need to make my font a bit bigger, I can't read it. <laughs> Hi and welcome back, uh, hope you enjoyed your lunch. Now I'm delighted to say that we are joined by Chora Singh, the Director of Operations at Emerald Airlines. Um, Chora will be discussing, as Emerald Airlines is in its infancy, he'll be discussing a bit of a background into the airline and be touching on their sustainability strategy. Great, th thanks for that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I I'm Chora Singh. I I'm the deputy director. I'm the director of operations at Ireland's newest regional airlines, uh, Emerald Airlines. Um, I spent the previous 19 odd years at Ryanair, um, most recently as the chief operating officer of their Austrian low-cost subsidiary, Louder Motion. Um, prior to that, I spent 10 years. Uh, as Deputy Director of Operations Control, running their operations in uh, Dublin. Um, firstly, I'd just like to thank everybody from the Irish Aviation Student Association. It's a pleasure to be invited to speak at this annual symposium. Uh, it's great to see uh, so many budding aviation students uh, here at, and watching at home um, at the IA uh, head HQ in Dublin. Um, Emerald Airlines is proud to support you all. And I can assure you, you've all chosen a great industry to be in. Um, aviation plays a huge role in Ireland, not only because we're an island nation uh, and need uh, aviation to link us to the rest of the world, but also pro to provide vital connectivity uh, within Ireland where the road and rail infrastructure is lacking. Ireland has some of the biggest players in the world in terms of aviation, uh, aircraft, leasing companies and airlines, and we have many Irish people leading the industry. One of those is the next speaker, uh, Alan Joyce, CEO of Qantas. We've got Eamon Brennan, who's the Director General at Eurocontrol, Michael O'Leary at Ryanair, Willie Walsh at IATA, and of course, my current boss, Conor McCarthy. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to work alongside three of the uh, aforementioned people, uh, and with many other talented uh, individuals in airlines, airports, air navigation service providers, and, and regulators uh, across Europe. Uh, and my one piece of advice to, to all you budding aviation students is to work for an airline. It, it, it's, it's really the only place that you're going to find out how you really take a, a, an aircraft off the ground and land it safely at its destination. Uh, and work in many different areas of, of the, the airline as you can. Everything from regulation, aircraft leasing, schedule building, revenue management, compliance monitoring, safety management, flight planning, crew rostering, IT infrastructure, data analytics, the list goes on. So I'll repeat it, find your calling at an airline. There's multitudes of opportunities. And if you get the opportunity, join a startup and experience the joy of creating something from scratch. So I'm just gonna give you some of the achievements that we've achieved at em Emerald Airlines uh, over the past 12 months, uh, a little bit longer than that as well. Um, Connor McCarthy, uh, you may well know, um, has a great track record in airline startups. He was at Ryanair when, when they first started up. Uh, he was co-founder of, of Air Asia. He was involved uh, with, 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 with uh, Alan Joyce. Uh, he started up uh, Viva Aerobus, uh, which is the, becoming the largest low-cost airline in South America. 
and, and he, he runs Dublin Aerospace uh, in Dublin. He's opened up Air, e Exeter Aerospace uh, and now Ashburn Aerospace as well. Um, so it wasn't much of a hard decision for me to join Emerald when they started up. Um, between February 2021 uh, and August 2021, um, the real hard work began. We put a management team together, including myself. Uh, we began writing the operations manuals, building the HQ in Hangar 5 in Dublin Airport, and implementing the IT infrastructure and systems that you need to run an airline. Um, we began the recruitment campaign for our pilots, engineers, and cabin crew. Um, and I'm pleased to say that you know we're, we're on track. Uh, in August last year, we won a tender to operate the Aer Lingus regional franchise uh, exclusively for the next 11 years. And then on September the 3rd, which was, which was a momentous day for us, after a rigorous inspection process from the Irish Aviation Authority, we were awarded uh, our air operator certificate, which demonstrates we were safe and compliant and had the capabilities to run an airline. At the same time, the Commission for Aviation Regulation granted MRO Airlines its operating license, uh, which, which requires us to satisfy uh, a business and financial fitness test. And then in December last year, uh, less than four months ago, Emerald was awarded the Irish Public Service Obligation Route between Dublin and Donegal um, after a competitive tender process. And then finally in February this year, we launched uh, our operations uh, by re-establishing re -establishing the Aer Lingus regional link between Dublin and the northwest of the country. We've now launched an extensive route network in March uh, and we've been growing it ever since. And we're gonna grow to 430 flights per week across 18 routes uh, on 12 ATR-72s. The ATR-72 is a great aircraft. Emerald chose it because of its fuel efficient, uh, it's, it's the most fuel efficient regional aircraft on the market. Its design provides a significant advantage, not only in operating costs, but also in CO2 emissions. The ATR emits 40% less CO2 on short regional flights. So just to touch quickly on our sustainability flight path, um, we're a new airline. We're obviously committed to help reduce aviation's carbon footprint. Um, we're going we're gonna to look at all possible uh, solutions, uh, but we, they need to be practical, whether it's technology, uh, flight operations, or, or alternative fuels. Um, we have to keep in perspective that aviation produces less than 2% of global greenhouse emissions. That's less than landfills do. Um, Regardless, we're still very focused on reducing our footprint, and being a brand new airline gives us a great opportunity to start as we mean to go on. Regrettably, the infrastructure and the technology is not quite in place yet, uh, particularly in the UK and Ireland. Many airlines, uh, many airports don't have sufficient electric charging points, and much of the innovation and technology is still in its infancy. We made our first smart choice by, by choosing the ATR-72, uh, and we, we've optimized our flight operations through things such as single engine taxi and taxi out, which reduces the burn uh, on the runway, and then using continuous descent and continuous climb at airports that allow us to, which reduces the fuel burn on the climb and, and the descent. We're also meeting our targets for sustainable aviation fuels. We're gonna have 2% sustainable aviation fuel by 2025, which will then increase to 5% by 2030 and this will increase to 20% by 2035. ATR will be fully certified to fly 100% SAF by the end of 2022, which means that we'll be able to fly with 100% if the production comes online. And then finally, the hydrogen fuel cell, cell powered electric engine is, is, is a significant game changer, um, particularly on the short haul aircrafts. This is likely to become the go-to power source for aircraft in the category. However, it's probably going to be another 10 years before we see uh, these commercially viable operations, particularly in the safety critical aviation sector. So th that's a short synopsis of where Emerald Airlines are at the moment and a quick highlight of some of our sustainability initiatives. Thanks. Thank you very much, sir. Um, very interesting to hear. And Hopefully we can see Emerald continue to, well, fly through. Um, so next up, 
Due to time difference, um, I was able to catch up with Alan Joyce this morning. Um, he is the CEO and Managing Director of Qantas. We had a great discussion covering a wide range of Qantas business model and how it has changed, how they've restructured, and also getting Alan's personal insights on certain topics. So I hope you enjoy. So I am delighted to introduce Alan Joyce, who many would know as the Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Qantas. He's held this position since 2008, and in that time, he's been involved in the airline's expansion into Asia, and more recently, has been involved in the airline's uh, recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Originally from Dublin, Alan held key positions at Aer Lingus and Anset before serving as founding CEO of Qantas' low-cost uh, carrier, Jetstar, for five years. Uh, before taking on his current role at Qantas. As such a prominent and successful figure in both aviation and the business world, I could go into detail um, about his whole career for the whole interview, but I prefer to hear it from the man himself. So, hi Alan, it's lovely to meet you, and hey, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. My great pleasure, it's, and it's very good to be able to speak to a lot of the students that you represent as well, so very excited about today. Brilliant. And then I'm going to get right into it. And to start off, I would just like to ask you a question regarding Qantas's fleet. Um, so as we are slowly coming out of the pandemic, um, I was just wondering, has Qantas re-strategized uh, the type of aircraft that they have? And if so, why? To adapt to the new world of air travel. Yeah, it's interesting, Matthew, because at the moment uh, we're doing two big fleet projects and are at the different ends of the spectrum. And Qantas is probably unique because we fly everything from a Dash 8 to a 30-seater aircraft all the way up to the A380s, um, nearly a 500-seater aircraft. Uh, so we have huge range as well. We fly very short sectors, sectors that are 20 minutes, and we fly very long sectors, sectors that are over 70 in hours. So our fleet is obviously quite complex given the nature of the markets that we operate on. And we currently have two uh, fleet evaluations that have been going. Uh, one of them is for what we call Project Sunrise, which we started just before COVID. And this was the project to fly nonstop from, uh, from London to Sydney or Melbourne and New York nonstop. So the longest sector on that would be 21 hours in the air. And as you can imagine, that fleet evaluation was quite a complex one. And we did it in 19. Um, and it looked at the 777X against the 350-1000 ultra long range version of the aircraft. And with, the, with those aircraft, we were talking to the manufacturers about specially modifying the aircraft for the Qantas's requirements, because we're really the only airline in the world that wants to do sectors like that. No other airline wants to fly that long. And no other airline probably could justify a big enough fleet. When you think of how far Australia is from everywhere, we could justify a fleet of 12 to 20 aircraft, which is what you need as a minimum size in order to make the economics work. And it was interesting before Sunrise, uh, before COVID, we thought Sunrise would work because people would want to fly direct. And every time you fly direct somewhere, uh, the, the schedule planners, the network planners will tell you, you get a stimulation of demand. More people will do it. Um, and you also have demand a premium. And we saw that when we flew from Perth to London. Uh, we were uh, most of the, mo the time before that was one stop through the Middle East or Singapore to get there. Uh, it became the most profitable route on Qantas's network before COVID internationally. And I came to highest satisfaction. So we thought there was a market to fly direct. And now post COVID, we've done a lot of research and we think more people uh, don't want to stop over somewhere given the uncertainties there are around travel, and they were willing to pay even a bigger premium to fly direct. So when we go through that evaluation, we're looking at things like obviously the safety of doing those operations, the fatigue management, um, we're looking at the manufacturers and how they produce the aircraft and what are comfortable with the reliability of the engines. But we're also having to figure out what is the demand for these services? How many first class seats? How many business class seats? How many premium economy do you put in? Um, and you also have to work out you're right at the limit of the capability of the aircraft. 
So can you do it year round? How many seats do you block off? Um, and then you, at the end of the day, you have to pull all of this together uh, to actually say, do the economics of this operation work? And can you get a return on invested capital back for your shareholders? And we're very optimistic about Sunrise. And we're going to come back to it and make a decision by the middle of this year. Um, and we think that could dramatically change the aviation industry. When Airbus and Boeing were competing for it, uh, the CEO of Airbus says they think it's like the, the moonshot. It's, the, um, it's the, the moonshot for aviation, the longest routes in the world. Uh, their engineers were so excited about working on the project I got very excited about designing the aircraft for it. I did point out to the head of Airbus that the Americans at the time had won the, the moon shot, uh, but he said he was going to reverse history, and the Europeans won this one, which was, uh, which was a good one for him. And then the other fleet planning project that we're doing at the moment is on the domestic fleet. And we, we're potentially, we, we're saying we've already done an evaluation between the, uh, the A320, 220 NEO, um, and the, the, the Boeing 737 MAX and the Embraer aircraft. And Airbus, again, have won that competition where we're saying we could order up to 299 aircraft to replace Jetstar and Qantas's domestic fleets and the regional fleets. And what's fascinating about this evaluation when we did it is the capability of these narrow bodies now. So the A321 XLR aircraft, which we're, uh, which we're going to order, can fly markets that we never thought would be possible. And again, post COVID would be great markets. So from Australia into Asia, where usually our domestic fleet just flies within the continent of Australia. And we've got this range capability we couldn't have before or the 220s replacing the 717, the regional jets, have twice the range of the regional jets. So you get all of these routes that open up uh, that we think will be economically viable, that weren't viable before COVID or this fleet. And during COVID, Qantas opened up 50 new routes domestically. Um, nearly all of them are working, uh, routes that weren't linked before. Um, and we think with these new aircraft, uh, the potential for us to even do more in this space is actually massive and more direct services like potentially from Canberra into Singapore, which you couldn't do with a wide body. There's not enough demand, but with a narrow body, uh, it, it, it works really well. And then the real thing that comes down to all of the fleet evaluations now, which is a big thing we're all working on, is sustainability onto these evaluations. Because coming out of COVID, the next biggest challenge is sustainability. So we're building in the price of carbon. Uh, we're looking in sunrise of offsetting all of, the, all of the passengers' flights on that aircraft. Um, and we're looking at what the manufacturers can contribute in sustainability. And most of these new aircraft improve the CO2 emissions by 25% on the, on the wide bodies and on the narrow bodies by 15%. So it's a big part of the case of actually moving to a new fleet renewal, given we think it's going to be the biggest challenge coming out of COVID is sustainability in the future. Yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that because that was going to be my next question about long haul travel in general even though there are these very um, fast improvements in the, you know, the aircraft and the sustainability aspect of it, do you think it can keep up and be sustainable in the future or will they have to be a bit of a peel back of it? Well, we've, we've always believed that air travel is such a positive force for good in the world. It links people, it gets somebody like an Irish man like me on the other end of the, of the world, it allows people to see their families, it allows people to have career opportunities, education opportunities, it encourages trade, it encourages better understanding of different cultures. So the decision always has to be, how can you make air transportation not a decision between flying and protecting the environment, you should be able to do both. And I think the good airlines are all working on their, um, their climate action plan. We announced ours a few weeks ago about what our interim targets are to get to net carbon neutral by 2050. And I mentioned on the very long haul flights like London to Sydney, we're building into the case to buy the aircraft that we will offset our carbon emissions. We're also purchasing fuel now, sustainable aviation fuel 
out to places like London, half our fuel uh, on our flights to Australia are sustainable. Uh, they're bought uh, from a company there. And we are working with a lot of our customers to say, well, are you willing to pay even more for your flights to cover sustainable aviation on it? Uh, so, so we think you can get to a stage, which we will be at, where you're not asking people to make the decision between flying or protecting the environment, you're doing both. And I think that will be, that's needed in aviation. I think every airline should be focused on this and the airlines that get this right will have a strategic advantage over the airlines that don't. Yeah, and even keeping with the, the line of sustainability, it would be great to hear about Qantas's ESG strategy. Now, I know we will have some other members of other prominent airlines speaking today, so I don't want you to kind of call them out or anything, but what would make Qantas stand out from the crowd in terms of your ESG strategy and make us choose Qantas over the other airlines? Well, you go through each of them in turn on the E part of it, the environmental parts. We were the second airline group after IAG to commit to net zero by 2050. And we've come out with uh, some very aggressive targets, which we will be achieved by 2030, 25% reduction on 19 levels, uh, but also a 10% of sustainable aviation fuel being purchased by them. Um, and we already have the largest carbon offset program of any airline in the world. 11% of our customers actually voluntarily offset their carbon emissions. Um, and we've committed uh, to getting rid of single-use plastics, getting rid of landfill as well. The airlines produce a lot of waste, as you're aware, and it's getting rid of waste that goes into landfill. So on all the measures for publicly listed companies, and particularly in airlines, uh, Qantas, I think, is seen as one of the leaders in the e-space. Then on the social space, uh, we've always taken a lead here, particularly in Australia, on a lot of social issues. Uh, we were one of the first companies to, um, to support a reconciliation action plan, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is uh, promoting and engaging with the Indigenous community here in Australia, which is very disadvantaged. We were painting aircraft with Indigenous artworks back in the 1990s. And our latest ad, I still call Australia Home, features the Indigenous culture, the oldest continuous culture in the world, 60,000 years in existence, features it very prominently. And we're very proud of what we've done on the, on the Indigenous inclusion side. But we've also, uh, we're one of the companies that took the lead on marriage equality for the LGBTI community here in Australia. Um, as, a, as an openly gay man myself, I took a leading role to play in that in the community here. And we got a lot of abuse from some elements of it, but it was an amazing outcome with the vast majority of people in Australia voting for it like they did in Ireland. Um, and we're very engaged in diversity, uh, gender diversity. We have one of the highest levels, I think, of female participation of senior management in, in, the, in the airline industry. Um, over 40% of our, of our senior management are female. Uh, we've got the same type of representation on the board. Um, and where areas where we're behind, we put programs into place to, uh, to, to, to catch up, like on pilots. Um, I think Qantas Link, our regional operation, is the second largest amount of female pilots of any airline in the world, but still um, as low as 15%. And Qantas overall is at 3%. Uh, but our target is that by the, in the next decade, we'll be getting our intakes at parity between male, males and females, so that we're selecting for the best people uh, to become pilots in the airline. So in the, the social side of it, I don't think there's another company that has been more active. And it, it goes to Qantas rescuing Australians overseas when they need it. It goes to Qantas being involved in bringing refugees into the country. We, we were there in Afghan, uh, to take Afghan refugees into Australia uh, through to the military air base in Dubai. Uh, we did it with Vietnamese refugees when uh, the Vietnamese war ended. Um, so Qantas has always been there at the forefront of doing what's right for the country and for the people here, which I think gives us a lead in this space. 
I'd argue with that pretty <laughs> pretty good. So um in terms, I know we've talked a lot about kind of quantity's future future strategies, but I would like to touch on um some take it back slightly and talk about COVID. Um being on the other side of the world, we may not have seen some of the more challenging aspects that you guys had to deal with. And I was just wondering kind of if you'd be able to talk us through those challenges and kind of how the resolutions came about and even if uh, let's say if a similar situation uh, arose in the future would there be anything you do differently in the same sort of um way yeah it, it was it was interesting when we look back on it i think the thing we were taken by surprise with which i think everybody was is how fast things happened and how fast you had to react because we go back to uh, to early um 2020 uh, when the first reports in January coming out of China of the virus. And we started getting a bit worried because we had SARS in the region, which cost, I think, a few hundred million dollars back when that happened um, back, uh, back in the mid uh, or early uh, 2000s. So we were in a position where we always had a pandemic as a risk. But I think we were even surprised at how fast this occurred because we, we, we did in weeks, we had the international borders in Australia closed down rapidly from China being the first one to every border closed and our entire international operation was grounded. But then we also had the effect of our domestic operation being grounded, even though we're one country, this, this is a federation. And each of the states could close their own borders, it turns out. Nobody knew the, the premiers, the governors of a state here, the equivalent of a governor in the US is our premiers, but nobody knew they had so much power until this happened. And that meant that really the only flying we could do for a period of time was in a, in a state. So the second largest city pair in the world is Melbourne, Sydney. It had before COVID 55 flights a day. It went down to, in some days, no flights and on average one flight a day, just overnight. And then we uh, we had routes that like Brisbane to Cairns, which is in Queensland, the big state, became the number one route on the network uh, because that's all people could travel to and you could travel only within your state. So, uh, so the rapid nature of it really got everybody by surprise. And we were left where when we did the maths, figured out this was going to happen and how rapidly the entire network was going to get grounded. And you have all of these overheads because we're an $18 billion business in revenue coming in. And we typically have costs of around $16.5 billion. So the revenue stopped, and, but the cost didn't. Uh, they were still there. So when we did the maths, we had 11 weeks to survive. Otherwise, we were going to go bankrupt. And that may, meant we had to take unbelievable tough decisions we made one third of our workforce redundant to restructure it we stood down 20,000 people were out pay uh, because we couldn't afford a payroll and we asked the government to help the people by paying a wage subsidy um, and we held, we asked all of our partner companies like Woolworths the big retailer if they could take employees in to give them jobs to get those people through the last two years and I suppose the big thing that we discovered, I think we did, I think you, we play most things right during that period of time. Probably the big learning I would say that we took out of it is either underestimating or overestimating the time for recovery. So in the A380s, as an example, we decided to put them in the desert because we thought the international would be the last one to recover. Now we're scrambling to get the aircraft back. We're having to do big maintenance on them. Uh, we're having to, uh, we're short the capacity internationally because the aircraft essentially uh, will take uh, into 23 before they're all activated. And then on the other side of it, we parked the 737s here on the runways in Sydney, which was too close to salt water. Um, so that causes you issues with maintenance of the aircraft where we should have put them into the desert also for a while. Plenty of deserts in Australia, which we could have flown them to, uh, but we didn't do that. So there's probably a few learnings out of it in trying to give yourself flexibility at both ends and making sure that you're not temporary storing aircraft that need long-term storage and long-term storing aircraft that in the end uh, you need to activate um, a lot faster. 
And uh, I think the other learning out of it is that big pent up demand um, comes out of this. So what we're seeing at the moment, and a lot of airlines are saying the same thing, but it is a lot bigger to demand than it was before COVID. We're seeing 120% growth in leisure traffic. We're seeing the business markets coming back to where they were. We're seeing huge demand internationally, even with some restrictions that are still on. Um, so the demand uh, we were a bit uncertain about, there were a lot of people saying Zoom and Microsoft Teams will take over aviation and I'll never get back to where it was going to be. All that turned out to be a lot of nonsense because at the end of the day, um, this does not replace the personal meetings of getting people in the room, doing deals, building up the personal connections or visiting those amazing destinations around the globe or having that family holiday somewhere unique. And that's why I think this has shown us to have confidence that this business model is very robust uh, through other technologies. Yeah, and I'm sure there'll be multiple college essays in the future all about it as well. Um, and then kind of, even though it's a very positive outlook and it's looking better, staying on that, is there anything that, and it doesn't have to be even Qantas related, that would excite you about the airline industry in the future? Well, I think that there's always the, the challenges and the opportunities that are there, which... Uh, and you can make every challenge an opportunity. I think getting the sustainability right, I think is a challenge, but it's a great opportunity for those that do it. Um, and I'm very excited about you know, things like creating a sustainable aviation fuel locally, which would be amazing because we spent before COVID 4 billion on fuel. So if we could create jobs here in Australia, um, use that to create um, income for the farmers that sometimes go through tough times here or generate feedstock that generates extra income. That's a phenomenal opportunity. Um, then on aircraft technology, I'm very excited about Sunrise. I think that's going to change the aviation industry. For you know this last tyranny of distance, Qantas was founded to overcome the tyranny of distance. And the last tyranny of distance for Australia is these one stops to Europe from Sydney and Melbourne. It's, it's a very unique opportunity that we are extremely excited about and think that would be good. I also think that there's, um, that there's huge, huge opportunities in getting the customer service proposition to new levels. So we're very excited about things like entertainment on aircraft. At the moment, when you fly to Australia, there isn't a high speed satellites that give you Wi-Fi on aircraft. Uh, where people are now coming with their own entertainment and want to be connected, but will be in the next few years, which I, I think will change it. We're investing very heavily. Uh, lots of people thought everybody was going to go the way of Ryanair and downgrade the product. In Qantas, we have Jetstar, which serves that market. When people want a price-sensitive ticket, it's fantastic. They can go for it in Jetstar. But on the Qantas end, we're investing in lounges, we're investing in seats, we're investing in this Sunrise aircraft that's going to be the best product in aviation uh, with, with, with unique first class, business class, premium economy. And we'll have less seats on the aircraft than anybody operating a 350 out there because there'll be more premium, there'll be more space, there'll be a better product that we're, that we're really enhancing even further. Um, and the same is true for our domestic operations. Believe it or not, we have 35 domestic lounges here in Australia. We're opening more all the time, just in Australia. And in the capital cities, we have three levels of domestic lounges. Our chairman's lounge is better than most of the airlines' first-class lounge traveling internationally, and that's a domestic lounge. So we're just really heavily investing in product and upgrading it and upgrading it because we think there's a, there's a place for both of those models and there's an opportunity to make good money at both ends of the market. And, of course, I hope one day we can see sustainable supersonic travel again, uh, which actually overcomes the, the, the noise problems because Qantas in 1964 put an order in uh, for 10 supersonic aircraft with Boeing and with uh, Concorde with the British Aerospace at the time. But unfortunately, uh, with the noise problems of those aircraft and the other environmental issues, they were never allowed to fly over land. And we never took delivery of them, even though we put money down. But that would be a phenomenal way of speeding up um, and overcoming another tyranny of distance the time it takes. And hopefully we'll see that in our lifetimes, which would be great if we do. Yeah, I'd just like to finally ask you, 
as an Irish person yourself, would you have any advice for for our audience, for our members um, that would be eager to follow or even anyone eager to follow in your footsteps in this um, industry? I think aviation is a phenomenal industry to get involved in. There isn't anything as exciting and as complex. When you think of what we talked about, their aircraft, capabilities of aircraft, evaluating aircraft and technology and changing the, the way people can travel. Uh, there's also these customer service links. Before COVID, we carried 50 million passengers a year. So you're, you're dealing with huge volumes of people and having interactions in so many different ways with people. You hire a lot of people. So, you know, Qantas has tens of thousands of employees. You're involved at the forefront of technology, whether it's data analytics, um, it's websites, it's apps that people use every day. So you have to have huge uh, technology capabilities as a business. And then it's the safest transport industry in the world. Yet, as my head of safety once said, we're putting you know, 500 people up in an aluminium tube with two rockets on it. And yet, if you ask people, um, if you ask people what's the safest industry and what's the safest airlines in the world, I think you get people like uh, Qantas and, and the aviation industry signaled out because we, I think, do a good job of making sure we minimize all of the risks around it. One piece of advice I would have for people is always take the opportunities when they come up to you. Every time um, I've seen an opportunity, I've always taken it, whether it's leaving the country and coming to Australia, whether it was leaving Aer Lingus to go to a different airline, and every job that you're offered to grab it, and even though it may be challenging, you know, setting up Jetstar was one of the best jobs I could ever uh, imagine doing, except what an airline from scratch with no, with no name, uh, with no brand, uh, with no product, uh, with no network, and having to create everything from scratch, uh, even what the fleet was going to be, was phenomenal. So grab those opportunities if they present yourself to them. But one last warning, my boss in Aer Lingus told me all those years ago, get used to the cycles, because every seven years, he said, you're going to experience a crisis. It's a bit faster than every seven years now, uh, but um, for the industry, the aviation industry, is very good at coping with unbelievable challenges that are thrown at them and coming out the other end uh, healthy and better than it was coming into it. And I have no doubt that the other side of COVID, the biggest challenge I think we've ever had in aviation, uh, the industry will come out a lot better, a lot bigger, and with the opportunities to grow a lot further, which is the, also an exciting thing about these, the, the, this business. Yeah, exactly. And that really kind of completes our theme of the day as well, the adaptability of aviation. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time and I can't ask you any more questions, but it has been such a pleasure to talk to you and hear all about Qantas and yourself and from your perspective. Um, again, I would, I would like to just thank you for joining us today and sharing all That's of your uh, thanks for your questions and thank, thanks for the engagement on it. And good luck to everybody that's getting into aviation. I, 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 I'm sure you will enjoy it. You'll have great careers. I really look forward uh, to working in this industry because, as I said, it's a fantastic industry. Perfect. So, as you can see, it was an incredible conversation. I uh, covered a lot of topics. The early morning might have gotten to me slightly, but it didn't get to Alan. Um, now, in terms of our uh, vouchers, our, we're giving away our first prize of the day. So Giovanni Facco, congratulations, you won a flight simulator voucher. And Emily Lawton, you just won an intro to flying voucher. So if you guys could contact us at info at and uh, we can send them out to you. Now, I know we had our aviation leasing panel earlier, but uh, from another aspect of aviation leasing, we have Andy Cronin, the President and Chief Financial Officer of Avalon, who will be discussing the future technology and the innovations within leasing in the future. Great, and thanks very much, Matthew, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, really appreciate it and honoured to be here at the IASA Student Symposium. Uh, always a highlight of the year, and thanks to uh, 
IASA and the Irish Aviation Authority for hosting it. Uh, just to give people a sense of my own background, first of all, um, I never uh, felt I was destined for a career in aviation. It was never a big dream of mine. It's something that, you know, one of those journeys through, call it sliding doors or through uh, chance, uh, I ended up spending all of my career uh, in aviation. Uh, I started out doing engineering uh, in UCD. Uh, I did mechanical engineering. And then just by chance, I ended up working in Dublin Aircraft on the in Dublin Airport on the aircraft maintenance side. And then found my way into the aircraft finance side uh, in Avalon. And I think that that's one of the features about aviation. So all of you uh, people are st students and study studying aviation or have an interest in aviation or else you wouldn't be on the call. And I think it's remarkable the way when people get into aviation, they choose to continue on in aviation. And I describe it as it's a little bit like once you get a little bit of kerosene, a little bit of jet fuel into your bloodstream, you're stuck with it for life. Uh, and people do tend to stay. And the reasons why I think people stay in the industry are it's an incredible industry to work in. It is a truly global industry. Uh, it's an industry which is quite young, actually. So, you know, modern jet travel uh, is really only about 50 years old and has grown almost exponentially uh, over those 50 years. It's an industry which is dealing with high stakes. It's an industry which is rapidly changing all the time with technology developments, with reactivity to market events, to global events. Uh, it is an industry which is growing as more and more people start to fly. And it's one of the industries which is a true global center of excellence based here in Ireland. Ireland is at the very center of aviation all around the world. And some of your speakers today, Enda Cornell or Alan Joyce, are examples of uh, Irish people who've gone out and had incredible careers uh, around the world, and there are many more like them. Uh, a large part of the airlines around the world have senior management teams with a decent dose of Irish content in it. So it's a little bit part of our, our heritage, but it's also part of, we now have a critical mass where we're producing talent, we're producing programs for students, which really accelerates their journey into uh, aviation and into the right, right places. So it, it's to Ireland a little bit like our core industries in Ireland being agriculture, pharma, technology. Um, within that environment, there's still opportunity for massive innovation uh, within our space. And if I look at my own journey, myself and a number of colleagues started Avalon from uh, zero, from a startup 12 years ago Today, it's a $30 billion balance sheet. It's the number two aircraft lessor in the world. Uh, we own, uh, manage, and have orders for close to 900 aircraft. It's a large, large business. There are very few industries in the world today, maybe technology, uh, where you can actually achieve that sort of disruption, that sort of scale from a startup uh, within your working career and even fewer when you can do that from within Ireland. So I, I think those features are really why uh, people tend to stay in aviation when, once they get involved in it, once they get absorbed into the network. And also importantly, the people side. So generally the people that you meet are all of a certain ilk. It's a respectful community. It's a community which is dealing with aviation and flying people and safety, and that comes first. Um, and that overriding um, impact and concern is what unifies the whole industry uh, and creates great cooperation between airlines, manufacturers, regulators, lessors, all of the other stakeholders uh, within the industry. Just to talk about the state of the industry, uh, now and COVID started 
a little over two years ago. I'm, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, but we said to our uh, people in the in the business, this is going to be the biggest learning opportunity of your careers. Uh, we said that right at the start in February 2020, and it was. We went through more restructuring, tough conversations, good conversations, uh, restructuring work with our customers, moving aircraft around the world. We did more deal activity, I'd say, in the past two years than in the previous 10 years uh, of the business. So I think there are a... Uh, whole generation of people who've just come into the industry who all of a sudden have disproportionate experience uh, compared to what they would have had had they joined the industry in a, a steady state environment. But we're just at the start of what is going to be a rapid but large scale recovery in the whole industry. And uh, already this year, I've been in Sri Lanka, Singapore, Tokyo, Dubai, New York, um, with the exception of New York, very few of those destinations were even, it was even possible to travel to pre-December 31. That's how rapidly the world is opening up and reopening as we adjust to living with COVID. And that's feeding directly into our airline customers. It's feeding directly into, you look up and there's airplanes in the sky again. The world is getting back to normal uh, very, very quickly. And with the exception of China, we think actually 2022 is going to be a really, really robust year, not just for the airlines, but also for lessors, maintenance providers, uh, all of the people who provide services to the industry, catering companies, etc. As we all get back to business as usual, business before COVID. I think as well, this is an incredibly exciting time to be uh, at your stage, uh, a student, uh, thinking about which industry you want to enter, maybe just having decided you want to enter aviation. Because I think that while this industry has grown, it continues to be an innovator, it continues to be a leader of globalization. It continues to think about where the value chain is and integration up and down uh, the value chain from airlines as they look at uh, internet platforms, as they look at booking technology, they look at integrating with hotel packages, they look at selling you your car hire, your train hire, all those kinds of things. So the business model of airlines is changing rapidly. The pricing structure is changing rapidly. Um, the amount of scope for innovation here is huge. And the biggest issue is one that I haven't spoken about yet, but it is topical, is the environment and sustainability. And that is a huge issue for our industry. And it's also a massive opportunity because the next generation of people who come into this industry are going to be the ones to drive the decarbonization of our industry. That's going to require new technology. That's going to require new practices. That's going to require new consumer behavior. And that's going to require new business models and new opportunities for businesses to be set up and for perhaps some existing businesses to fail if they don't move quickly enough. Uh, it's a change that's coming rapidly. Um, it's a change that's impacting freight. It's impacting e-commerce. Uh, it's impacting a really important and growing segment that we're involved in, which is mass urban mobility. So at Avalon, we have invested uh, in an early stage, what's it called an eVTOL, an electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, manufacturer, actually called Vertical Aerospace, based in the UK. And think of these uh, aircraft, not like that aircraft or that aircraft, with two big gas guzzler engines on wings, this is like an electric helicopter that lifts off uh, almost like a drone with eight rotors uh, lifting it off the ground vertically. It then switches to aircraft style flight and then goes back into hover mode to land. All electric, no local emissions, no operating emissions. We think that is a game changer 
because all of a sudden people will be able to, instead of driving uh, for up to 100 miles or 120 miles, people are able to fly and get into one of these things for the cost of an Uber for the same trip distance. So it's an incredible opportunity for us uh, and for the world um, to see how this changes the world. And I describe it like e-scooters. I remember being in Paris a few years ago and tripping over something on the, the footpath and not knowing really what it was. It looked like a scooter, but it was an e-scooter. That was the first time I had seen an e-scooter. Now you go to any city around the world and you see thousands of these things. So if we can crack mass urban mobility, it's a new mode of transport that's completely different to anything that we have before and is um, a uh, real disruptor in how we think about people moving around the world. That's an example of the opportunity that's in front of us in aviation. And those aircraft are never going to challenge the 737s and A320s that are flying around Europe or long haul aircraft and so on. But it's the start of a journey of emission free travel, starting out with a hundred mile range, but pretty quickly going to 500 mile and beyond in terms of the range capability of those aircraft. From our perspective at Avalon, we made the decision to invest in the manufacturer, uh, which then IPO'd uh, in New York in December. Uh, we ordered 500 of the aircraft and we've actually been amazed. We've placed every single one of those aircraft with airlines all around the world, from Japan Airlines to Goal in Brazil, not impacting our existing commercial jet business, but actually a massive synergy benefit to doing business with the same airlines, uh, just dealing with a different product. So that's been a really uh, important transaction for us, not just because of the financial returns, but actually it's the first step into that new world. And what's going to happen is the Paris Accord, which is a, a global agreement of countries around the world, is going to drive aviation to zero emissions by 2050. And that's going to drive a absolute requirement from customers, airlines, lessors, manufacturers, aircraft owners to innovate. And that is going to create whole new operating models for airlines and transport companies around the world. And frankly, this generation, the people who are looking at this video are the people who are going to be in the workforce delivering on that and making that happen. At Avalon, we are really passionate that the really transformative ideas in our sector are less likely to come from people who've been working in the industry for 10, 20 or 30 years they are much more likely to come from people new to the sector with fresh thinking, fresh ideas, and a new way of doing things. And that's why we invest heavily in bringing in new talent, uh, the best talent we can find, obviously. We've invested in a graduate program. Uh, we are a lead sponsor for a master's in aviation finance, and we're launching an Innovate for Ireland uh, platform with a goal of creating 10,000 PhDs over a period of time uh, to be produced in Ireland. We firmly believe that that is the core to our competitive success over the long term, is to keep bringing in that pipeline of new talent, new ideas, fresh thinking, to disrupt how we think about our industry and also ultimately to disrupt our industry. Thank you so much for your time in listening uh, to me today. Really appreciate it. I wish you all the very best uh, with your studies and hope you enjoyed the day and the various speakers. Thank you. And thanks, Andy. Uh, very interesting again. So as the Irish Air Corps ce is celebrating its centenary this year, we are delighted to be joined by uh, Commandant and Squadron uh, Commander Michael Barco who will be discussing the development of the Air Corps throughout the years. All set?
Uh, thank you, Matthew, and uh, thanks to the um, Irish uh, Aviation Student Association yeah. for inviting me to uh, speak uh, for the next while just on topics uh, relating to the Irish Airport. Uh, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Commandant Michael Barco, and I'm Officer Commanding 104 Squadron in the Irish Airport. Um, I'm originally from Dundrum in Dublin, and I went to school in St. Benilda's College and um, after school, I went and studied mechanical engineering for four years in DIT in Bolton Street. And it was in my final year in mechanical engineering that I applied for a cadetship in the airport, uh, to which uh, my application was successful. Um, so that followed uh, standard cadetship training, the Cura, followed by ground school and flight training here in Baldon. And I was commissioned in 2010. And um, upon commissioning, I was posted to 104 Squadron as a uh, as a squadron pilot on the Cessna aircraft at the time. And uh, after around eight months of flying the Cessna, then I was moved to 101 Squadron to fly the Castle. Um, I flew both aircraft types for a number of years, and then in 2013, then I went and flew with the Garda Air Support Unit on the uh, the Fender aircraft. And um, again, I did that for another couple of years and. In 2016, then, I joined the flying training school as a flight instructor, uh, teaching ab initio uh, pilot training. Since then, I've had a variety of roles, and uh, I've worked in some staff appointments in Defence Force Headquarters in Strategic Planning Branch, and for a time uh, as the Irish Air Corps Press Officer. And finally, that loop closed, and I came back to 104 Squadron, uh, but this time as the Squadron Commander. So I was very fortunate that um, I was in charge of the squadron for uh, the standing down of the Cessna fleet. So obviously a very iconic time for the organization. Uh, the longest serving aircraft in the history of the airport, uh, having given 47 years of service. Uh, so I was very privileged to be uh, in that appointment when, when the aircraft were stood down from operational service. But with that broad, uh, I suppose a very interesting challenge and time whereby uh, I was in charge of introducing the PC-12 into operational service in the airport. And there was a couple of challenges along the way. And I suppose initially the first things first is just the challenge of actually just introducing a new piece of hardware into the organization and getting everyone trained up. But what made that challenge a little bit more difficult was that I was introducing it into a squadron that was used to flying a uh, single pilot and uh, VFR only uh, in generally very good weather conditions here uh, in Ireland. So obviously all of the Cessna operations were on island. So it was a, a massive transformation process required to get the squadron into a position to fly a multi-pilot aircraft uh, for day and night operations in all types of weather and the variety of operations span across logistics support, air ambulance, and uh, ISOR, which is intelligence, uh, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Uh, so three out of the four PC-12 aircraft delivered are capable of being equipped with uh, surveillance equipment. So uh, what made the challenge then, I guess, a, a little bit more difficult was the introduction of COVID. So uh, I think it's something that everyone can relate to in their both their professional and personal life. Uh, so it all ramped up and happened very quickly. So the original contract was to uh, acquire three PC-12 aircraft. And um, in a very short amount of time, in, in just 13 working days, that, that number increased to four. Um, and we took delivery of the first PC-12 six months ahead of the three Spectre aircraft and began operations very quickly thereafter, responding to the COVID crisis. So the reason why there was such a demand um, for the PC-12 during COVID was that the standard logistics network that we would use in the Defence Forces to support our troops overseas collapsed. So... The Air Corps traditionally would have always transported, um, I suppose, sensitive equipment such as ammunition and weapons to our troops overseas. But for standard things, maybe, uh, you know, uh, just the likes of regular uniforms or uh, regular resupplies that we might have to send to our troops overseas, generally 
they would all go in the belly of a commercial aircraft. But obviously that commercial network uh, came to a halt during COVID. Uh, and therefore we we uh, we stepped up and um, we became that kind of, I suppose, cargo courier for that period of time. So it was very, very interesting. Um, we, on a regular basis, we got to do resupplies over to Lebanon, uh, Western Sahara. Um, we've even been down to the Syrian border uh, with Turkey and various other sort of European countries such as Spain and Finland and uh, too many to name them. So it was a great way actually to develop uh, our pilot skills here within the squadron and uh, I suppose own that skill of which was logistics flying throughout Europe. And uh, beyond that then we uh, also had to develop our, our air ambulance capability and uh, the aircraft itself is equipped with a life support system uh, that we use for medical flights and um, so we worked in conjunction with our technicians here in uh, 103 squadron in the airport to develop out procedures and as well as an efficient way of loading and unloading patients. Um, and then finally then, uh, at the moment, we're developing out the ISR uh, capability, which is the uh, surveillance capability of the aircraft, uh, with the intention, hopefully, of actually deploying the aircraft overseas to a mission uh, as an ISR asset to that mission. So, um, Moving on, I, I, I suppose something that you may or may not be aware of is that um, the aircraft that was bought, I suppose, in a hurry was painted in quite an unusual paint scheme. So uh, it was a uh, white in color with red and yellow stripes. So it, it wasn't your, your typical military uh, library that you typically see. Uh, but the reason for that is that that aircraft was originally bound for another customer in China. And uh, when COVID came, they canceled the order and uh, it was ourselves that bought that aircraft. However, we needed the aircraft to get online so quickly that we didn't have enough time to respray it into standard airport colors. Uh, so the aircraft flew around uh, in that library from, I suppose, April 2020 until March uh, 2022, uh, where finally we gave it a, um, a well-deserved uh, new paint scheme. Um, so. You, for those of you who know the aircraft, you might think the paint scheme is a bit unusual. So it's a bit of a hybrid scheme between the grey scheme that we currently have on the PC-12 aircraft and the more traditional uh, camouflage scheme that you would have typically seen back in the 1930s and 40s on some of the older uh, Air Corps aircraft, such as the Avril Anson. And the old roundel is, is on the side of it as well, where the white uh, that we're typically used to seeing in the middle of the roundel is actually on a square background. And um, one of the reasons why we painted it in that unusual paint scheme was to mark the 100 year anniversary of the Irish Air Corps. So uh, again, it's a very, uh, I suppose, privileged time to be serving in the organization through its centenary year. And uh, the Air Corps really was the, was the start of aviation in the state, uh, the start of both military and civil aviation, which is unusual and uh, a lot of historic and uh, I suppose memorable aviation um, uh, memories I suppose started here in Baldon with the first successful crossing of the Atlantic from uh, east to west. Okay? So uh, uh, very, very interesting times and interesting times for the year ahead as well uh, with a number of events happening to mark the centenary year. So from 104 squadron's perspective, uh, we're lucky enough to be involved in uh, a number of flight paths, uh, marking uh, several military installations, marking their 100th year anniversary uh, around the country. So it's a good chance for us to hone our skills uh, in terms of formation flying. Uh, typically, it's uh, something that would be done by the uh, PC-9s, and the PC-9s will continue to do it as well, just to share some of that workload out. Um, uh, 104 squadron is, is going to conduct some of those flight paths. So, should be, it should be something, uh, I suppose, a little bit different for, for people to see. Moving on to, I suppose, the future of the Air Corps and I suppose taking stock of where we've been at for the last 100 years and looking forward now uh, into the next 100 years, but in particular looking forward into the next 20 years of the Air Corps. So for those of you that are familiar with the Air Corps um, and familiar with the Defence Forces, you can imagine it's, it's quite an exciting time 
uh, to be part of the organization. So the Commission on Defence has recently published a report uh, with various um, courses of action proposed, okay? And I suppose two out of three of those courses of action really indicate that the Defence Forces itself should be uh, better equipped, have a higher capability to defending the state. And really it's quite an apt time for that publication to be uh, uh, to be put out into the public domain. Um, public interest really has increased due to the war in Ukraine on our defence forces here, on the importance of having a capable defence force, and especially as a neutral uh, country, uh, the importance of having a, uh, a suitable and capable defence forces to protect that neutrality. So what we've already started to see is the investment in new hardware, obviously with the PC-12s coming online. Um, those of you who are familiar with the CASA fleet, which is uh, our maritime patrol aircraft, they're the, the, the big blue aircraft you see flying uh, low level over the ocean. Uh, they are coming to the end of their service life next year, and they're going to be replaced by a more advanced and bigger version of the CASA, which is called the CASA CN295. Um, so again, very, very exciting time for new hardware to be introduced. But I suppose the thing about capability development and uh, I suppose growing an organization is that it's not just all about the acquisition and the purchase of new hardware. It's really the personnel behind that, um, both in terms of aircraft technicians, pilots, uh, support staff, air traffic controllers. It's important that they all grow uh, with the new uh, hardware and with the new capability and uh, I think we've seen as well that just in terms of numbers, it's very important that we grow the numbers of the Defence Forces and in particular the Air Corps, which is it's the smallest of the, uh, the Army, the Naval Service uh, and the Air Corps, that, that we grow that in order to have a meaningful ability to defend the state. So it's the next step, which is, which is a pretty exciting one and one that was listed in the White Paper back in 2015 and again on the Commission on Defence, was the need to introduce a primary radar service. Okay, so Ireland, unfortunately, is one of the only black spots in Europe uh, whereby we cannot see uh, to the full extent what is flying in our airspace. And um, just to compare that to, to, to something we saw in the media there recently was when the, uh, the Russian uh, naval fleet uh, decided to position themselves for an exercise off the southwest coast. And um, so likewise, from an aerial picture, it's very important that we have an ability to see what is flying through our airspace in a real time and accurate, uh, meaningful way. So the introduction of primary radar is going to be one of the main projects for the airport to develop within the next five years. Um, and with that, then we need to ask ourselves the question, well, if we're able to see what's in our airspace and if we don't like what we see, how are we going to police that? So are we going to uh, look towards setting up partner agreements with other countries for them to police our airspace? Or is it a capability that as a neutral country, we need to be able to provide ourselves? So if the decision is made that it is a capability that we need to provide ourselves, well, then we will need to uh, buy some form of intercept aircraft. Okay, so some sort of a jet fighter aircraft to uh, intercept any potential targets that come into Irish airspace. So generally, a primary radar capability and a jet intercept capability work hand in hand. There's no good in having one without the other. So if we had jets, for example, and we did not have a primary radar service, we really, they wouldn't be all that effective because we wouldn't be able to, uh, we wouldn't have, I suppose, the real time picture of, of, of uh, the targets that we need to intercept. And likewise, if we have a primary radar service and we don't have jets, well, then we can get a full picture of what's out there. But really, can we do anything about it? The answer is no. So, in my opinion, it's a uh, interesting times ahead. Uh, and I hope that the resources or the adequate resources are allocated to it in order for us to fulfill our task. Um, 
Something that you may be interested in is uh, the cadet ship uh, that is being launched very, very shortly. So uh, I was speaking to the recruitment officer yesterday just to get an update for you on what's happening with the Air Corps cadet ship. And he assured me that it's being launched in the very near future. Um, so keep an eye out on military.ie and our social media platforms on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to find out when that launch will take place. And um, when it does launch, and if you are interested in applying, you'll find a full list of the terms and conditions on military.ie. Aside from that, the, uh, the general process when applying for a cadetship will be a online application form. Uh, and that's gonna be followed by some aptitude testing. You'll be invited into Baldonald then for a day to conduct uh, fitness testing, a group assessment, and some further aptitude testing. And thereafter, if you're successful in that phase, you'll be invited back again for a interview and some psychomotor testing and a, uh, a quick chat with a psychologist. So that's the that's the general process. But again, it'll all be listed out uh, in more detail on military.ie when that is being launched. So I'd like to thank you all for your time and uh, I wish you all the best of luck in your future studies and careers. Perfect. So thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I would now like to introduce Mike Lennon, the Airlines Propositions Director of Travelport, who was given the difficult task of trying to fit a whole in industry, its background and where it's going into a 20 minute talk. Um, he'll discuss in the future and we are delighted to have him in person in the IAA today. So thanks, Mike. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Mark Lenehan. I work for Travelport, and Travelport connects more than 400 airlines to tens of thousands of agencies in 180 countries. But I'll explain a little bit more what that means uh, in my presentation. I'm going to talk about GDS, PSS, uh, the history of those solutions, and their short-term future. So first of all, the PSS, Passenger Service Solution Space, Here's a five minute summary. Most of you have heard of reservations and inventory systems. In very simple terms, the inventory is where you store what you can sell. For each flight, how many seats you have available in a different booking classes and cabin classes. And then when you actually make the booking, you have a reservation um, or what we call in the industry PNR, passenger name record. And that's the traditional PSS system or reservation system or airline host that was created in the 1960s and 1970s. The first one being a joint venture between Sabre and, uh, sorry, between IBM and American Airlines to create the Sabre reservation system. Other pieces that are important to that are pricing. When you've got a flight, how much does it cost? And to do pricing, the system also needs to be able to handle fares. And another system, if you're uh, in air, airline operations at all, uh, or airports, you understand what a departure control system is. And the departure control system essentially connects everything that's happening in airline reservations to the actual operations, including things like uh, boarding control, uh, check-in, and weight and balance. So that was the way it was up until the 2000s, and then Tim Berners-Lee invented the internet. Um, we had the emergence of the low-cost carriers. We had deregulation. Um, and obviously, uh, you know, what emerged at that time was a, a system that could do a lot more for the airline. So um, you have what we call the airline PSS, or passenger service system. And it started with adding an internet booking engine, IBE. This is the kind of transactional piece of the airline website that allows you to shop and book flights online. Um, and you also had pricing was extended to shopping. So instead of giving you the price of one flight, shopping can do all of the different fares on all the different flights across multiple days. You also had merchandising and retailing. And the idea with merchandising and retailing is that you can define all of those ancillary products and bundles 
um, in the tool. Um, in that time as well, you know, IATA had the electronic ticket uh, project, which actually allowed airline distribution to become all digital. Um, also, you had the emergence of revenue management. Um, airlines started out with fixed price, gradually introducing more and more price points till we get to the dynamic pricing uh, process we have today. So those items in orange in that diagram were all the new elements that got built into the PSS over the years. So who builds these systems and sells them to airlines? A whole bunch of airlines actually build and maintain their own uh, PSS. Uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. But the four biggest providers are Amadeus, Navitair, Sabre, and Travelsky. And you can look all of those companies up online if you want to know a little bit more about them in their own words. But using my source, T2RL, which is a specialist consultancy in this area, um, this is what their uh, you know, market share looks like. Amadeus and Navitair together um, constitute 37% of uh, passengers booked. That's essentially across you know, 1,200, 1,300 airlines, the whole world. Um, you know, over a third of, of bookings in 2021 were made on Amadeus and Navitair. I've grouped those together because Navitair is actually owned by Amadeus. But the Amadeus Altia system is used by typically full service carriers, um, like the big three uh, uh, group in Europe, uh, whereas Navitair tends to get used by low cost carriers. It's more, um, its functionality is more focused on, on their business model. The next biggest um, PSS provider is Sabre, very strong in America. Um, have had American Airlines as their customer since day one when they were founded. And then, the, the, I suppose, in third place is Travelsky. Um, Travelsky is an interesting one in that it does the majority of reservations um, for airlines in the Chinese domestic market, but very little outside of China. And there you can see China, Air, China uh, Eastern, China Southern, and Air China are all hosted or, or managed by Travelsky. There's a whole bunch of other systems in that category. There's a list of them there on that page. But none of those guys have more than uh, or have even reached 2% market share. Also, a big sector in there is in-house, where a lot of airlines whether essentially control and manage their own PSS system, um, whether it was built on a mainframe or newer technology, including actually uh, Aer Lingus uh, in Dublin uh, and EasyJet, if you want some examples that are closer to home. The other part of this PSS stack is that sometimes airlines build it themselves, sometimes they get everything together from the likes of Sabre of Amadeus, but there are a lot of a, a rich ecosystem of tech companies that do different pieces, including Irish companies like Openjaw and Datalex that do merchandising solutions and API solutions and booking engines uh, for airlines. Um, Pros and Fairlogix are interesting ones to watch there because They've kind of acquired the way into control of all of those um, orange squares you see in the airline PSS, which is really the value add um, piece of um, the passenger service system. And of course, airlines also build some of these systems themselves. So even Sabre and Amadeus, big Sabre and Amadeus customers, will sometimes build their own booking engine, uh, as a, an example, British Airways. Um, just one thing that's mentioned there is uh, API. Um, API stands for Application Programmer Interface, but really it doesn't matter what it stands for. API in simple terms is a way for one system, computer system or program, to talk to another computer system. And more importantly, the systems of one company, like for example an online travel agent or a booking tool, to talk to the systems of a different comp company, such as an airline's passenger service system. And so IATA NDC, and I encourage you to go on to IATA and, and look at their NDC program. You'll see lots of videos like that one with uh, Yannick Hoyles describing what that is in more detail. But essentially, it's a 10-year-old program to try and um, renovate distribution and bring in new standards and, and better retailing outcomes. So I don't know if I did that in five minutes, but uh, I'll go on to the next part of my session, which is to talk about the GDS, which is, it includes Travelport, the company I work for. So if we hop back in time to those systems created in the 1970s, including Sabre, back then, 
what a travel agent had to do if they wanted to connect to an airline is they had to connect to each airline directly. And this was before the internet, so they used a thing called the CETA network. So even back in the 1970s, really before the internet became a consumer proposition, um, the travel industry, airports, travel agents, and airlines were all networked together. Um, and this is where you had sort of corporate buyers and consumer buyers were going to travel agents, and travel agents had to connect to the airline directly. But if a travel agent was selling 20 different airlines or 100 different airlines, they had to manage 100 different connections. So in the 80s, the GDS, the global distribution systems, emerged. And what they would do is they would connect to the airlines for the travel agent, so the travel agent could go to one place to see all of the airlines together. Um, and that's where those companies originated from. A quick one on the standards. The standards were developed in the 1980s, and they're very, very old. So this is kind of essentially um, the, the, the equivalent of, of, of fax or telex messages um, being sent around on, on pre-internet uh, connectivity. So what does the GDS do today? Look, um, essentially for a travel agent or a corporate booker, especially, and corporate travel management companies, um, they allow them to search and shop and book, and they see a broad range of content across air, car, hotel, rail, activities, and so on. For the airlines, not every airline uses a GDS. Uh, it's not for every airline. A lot of the low-cost carriers prefer to focus on direct sales to the consumer. They do not necess not necessarily interested um, in uh, dealing with travel agents. But even amongst the low-cost carriers, um, like uh, Southwest, for example, we're seeing an increased focus on trying to win business customers. And you know, they work for WIT Travelport and other GDSs to, to get to those corporate bookers and uh, travel management companies. So who are the distribution systems? And here are some names you've seen already, but the big three global distribution systems are Amadeus, Sabre, and Travelport. Roughly similar in size, Amadeus is a little bit bigger. Um, what I would say about the, these are there are really only three global distribution systems, but there are a whole raft of regional distribution systems that are very similar. You also have new entrants into the distribution space. So these are all these aggregator companies, as they're called, who are doing maybe not everything uh, a GDS does. They maybe don't have access to as many airlines, or they don't have access to all of the servicing and ticketing functionality. But they essentially allow travel agents to shop and book. And before I add to NDC, they were using airline APIs that were proprietary, or they were web scraping, which some airlines really, really don't like. Um, but that's how they were getting the content to travel agents. And this is where we land with distribution today. Most airline sales are considered either direct or indirect. Direct means you sell directly to consumer. And this is the kind of the innovation that, that uh, Ryanair started in the 2000s is to say, we don't need travel agents. The internet exists now. Um, you all went to, or your mom, mothers and fathers all went into cyber cafes instead of travel agents when they wanted to fly Ryanair. But way, the way direct sales work now is the consumer is using their web browser or they're using their mobile phone. They might be using a meta search like Skyscanner or Kayak, and that's directing them then to the airline uh, booking engine, the IBE. Or it might direct them to an online travel agent like eDreams or Expedia or Priceline. Indirect sales are, is done through um, the travel agent connecting their systems directly to the airline. Uh, that's complicated, expensive. Um, so what most travel agents do is they might have one or two direct connects to airlines, but they rely on aggregators and GDSs to give them access to everything else. One other thing about that diagram is you'll see that the line from the aggregators in the GDS goes into IATA NDC. And the advantage of that is you get all of that retailing and merchandising functionality and all the brands and information that the airline has built up over the years. Um, whereas the legacy connectivity into the inventory system, it might be more real time, it might be more efficient in some ways, but you're missing out on all of that sort of retailing goodness. So I, how am I doing for time? Be honest. I'm okay? Right. right. So to wrap up, where is this going? Um, in Travelport, we did some research. Um, you know, our view is that by the end of 2022, this year, Travel will be back to about 85% of its pre-pandemic levels. 
is actually tracking somewhere ahead of that in terms of recovery. Some domestic markets are now well in excess of 2019. And to repeat what you heard from, you know, Alan Joyce and, and the other airline people here, um, you know, there are supply issues, but right now demand um, is outstripping supply and demand is, is, is back to even higher than what it was in 2019. So it's really the supply issues and trying to reopen airports and get aircraft flying again that's, that's holding the industry recovery back. The demand is there. We did research to confirm that. We did research with more than 2,000 travel consumers. And we asked them, what would they give up or what would they sacrifice to keep a holiday? And I think our results prove that holidays and travel, leisure travel especially, is essentially uh, recession proof. You know, two thirds of people will essentially give up spas or cinema or even buying new clothes. And you can read a lot more of that data on travelport.com. Another thing we've discovered is an emerging issue. The travel industry has fallen behind. Um, far more, you know, nowadays clothes, finance, and food. You know, finance is really galling to me. Travel is supposed to be the sexy, cool industry. Um, how can we fall behind banks? But we have in terms of innovative digital experience. And part of the problem is there an experience gap. People find traveling, maybe not the act of traveling, but being in the destination, the outcome of travel, very, very enjoyable. It is the most desirable product. This industry has the most desirable product. It's way above electronics, automotive, every, fashion, everything else. But the experience of shopping and booking does not actually um, come anywhere close. So I think there are two mega trends. There's obviously environmental sustainability and the other one I'm going to talk about is modern digital retailing. You've heard a bunch of the other speakers talk about environment. I don't really have anything to add. As a distributor, we don't fly planes. Um, we can't introduce SAF. Um, but what we're seeing is that there's this amazing uh, demand uh, for CO2 reduction. So if you think about it, if a big bank or a big tech company who are the buyers of business travel um, decide that they want to be, uh, you know, uh, net zero or CO2 neutral or they want to offset, then that means that every supplier, including their travel agents, their corporate travel managers, um, their tech companies, their consultancies, and the airlines that all of those companies use, all have to report um, accurate CO2 numbers. Um, will, that, uh, will offsetting be enough? I don't know. Will behaviors actually change? I also don't know. Um, like Alan Joyce said, I think we need to keep travel and protect the environment. But that's not really my area of expertise. My area of expertise is retailing, specifically modern digital retailing. So millennials, uh, Gen Z grew up in the world with all of these brands where you interacted with a brand on a mobile phone. Everything was instantaneous. Everything was online, 24-7, fully automated, personalized, data-driven. And that's the world that we came into at the start of pandemic. What did the pandemic do? It made boomers and Gen X like me into millennials. It forced us to shop online. It forced our parents to shop online. It forced our families to get used to using Zoom. It forced everyone to remote work. So now everybody has been turned into a digital native. That is the transformative power of the pandemic. And that, those digital natives have expectations. This is what they expect from a modern digital retailer. Fast, convenient, fully automated um, type of service. But this is not the service that the travel industry is offering today. Another part of retailing is a mindset. Um, if you're a product company, you focus on selling a product. You want to find people who will buy your product. But if you're a retailer, you think differently. You say, I have a customer how many of their needs I can, can I meet? So think everyone from Apple to Netflix to Amazon to Tesco. It's meeting customers' needs is what they're about. Will they sell their own product? Yes. Will they sell other people's products? Yes. This is also my belief that airlines, despite all of the uh, big words about retailing, uh, you know, and every air other airline CEO saying they want to be the Amazon of travel, I don't think airlines are retailers. When it comes to the crunch, airlines fly planes. Uh, you know, travel agencies are the true retailers. So what I want to say really, and the whole point of this presentation is, modern digital retailing is the mega trend. And 
If I had another two hours, I could talk about what that means for mobile, the implications of IATA, NDC, and One Order, the brands and dynamic offers that have led to you know, much more diversified air product, continuous dynamic pricing, another really interesting topic. But what all of this is driving towards is to create a better end-to-end uh, -end retailing experience for the consumer. And for that to exist in the travel industry, the travel industry has to work together. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for your time. If you want to connect, um, please do so. I'm happy to, very happy to take connections from students and, and answer questions. All right, okay. thank you. That's the spot there. Oh, I wish uh, all my college courses were condensed that, that, that good. Um, but thank you very much, Mark. That was an excellent uh, presentation. And we uh, unfortunately could not get Dermot back uh, onto the stream but um, we'll hopefully have a conversation with them in, in the future, uh, so keep an eye on our social media platforms. Um, but for our final presentation of the day, we are joined by Niall Maloney. He is the Airport Operations and Commercial Director for Shannon Airport. He will be discussing the recovery of the airport and its day-to-day -day operations. Whenever you want. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Matthew, and good afternoon to you all. Uh, my name is Niall Maloney, I'm the Operations Director here at Shannon Airport. Uh, I'm the Account Manager for the airport, I'm basically responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the airport, the airport operation itself, engineering, security, fire and rescue, retail concessions, and you know what, you might throw in some marketing and PR as well. So there's never a dull day in Shannon, and always working in a small airport, it's always a varied uh, working life that you have, which makes the job very interesting. This is my 42nd year in the aviation industry, and I'm grateful to the Irish Aviation Students Association for the invite to speak today. For me, it's very important to pass on knowledge, experience, and expertise to the next generation, because that's what I gained when I joined this industry back in the early 1980s. And it's really people who gave their time to me and passed on their knowledge and expertise that I'd like to share with people today, and I have done in the past. For me, working in the airport is, is not a skill that you learn out of a book, but it's a learned skill that one develops and hones over many years, and in my case, decades. You learn more from your mistakes than from your successes, but you just have to ensure that your mistakes are little ones and are not repeated. Uh, Shannon Airport is part of Shannon Group. Uh, you also have Shannon Commercial Properties and your Shannon Heritage. So we have three business units here in the Midwest, all supporting Shannon Group, all in various activities and, and modes, from transport to industry to tourism. And again, it makes a good combination in terms of to bring tourism industry and passengers into the Midwest. Today, as part of your session on a recovering and innovating aviation, I've been asked to talk briefly about the recovery of services and operation at Shannon Airport. And this I will do from a perspective of a small regional airport who since its inception in the 1939 has had a roller coaster of challenges. We've had more lows than highs. And you're going back to the 1960s, the advent of the jet engine, you had the fuel crisis of the 70s, you had the economic downturns of the 80s and the noughties. Uh, you've had, um, I suppose, the COVID process we've gone through, we've anti-war protests, we've the withdrawal of max jets. So really, we've had many challenges in the business. And there's one thing about challenges is that if you're used to them, it does harden one's resolve. And it does also help you to equip you to deal with the unforeseen. And by God, did COVID challenge us like never before, not alone as an airport, but as an industry in total. But one can talk, talk about recovery. Uh, but for me, initially, it was all about survival. Our scheduled traffic disappeared completely in late, in late March 2020. And we immediately took measures to protect the remaining parts of our business, which was cargo, business jet traffic, transiting business, both passenger and cargo, our maintenance, and repair, maintenance, repair, and overhaul business. And at the same time, we support the aircraft leasing industry, where at its peak, we had over 100 aircraft parked in our airfield. Like every other business during this period, we made some very hard decisions. We reduced headcount, took as much cost as possible out of the business in order for us to enable to continue to trade. And we had a huge reliance on the government support through the TWS and EWS schemes and rates waiver. At the same time, we also took the time to support our stakeholders, including ground handlers, food and beverage, in-flight caterers, concessionaires, to trade during this period. Because what we did realize is that there was always going to be a recovery. 
that was always in our mind. And we want to ensure that those who've supported pre-COVID were also in a position to trade post-COVID. Easier said than done. And to be fair, the recovery took a lot longer to come around than anyone would have initially anticipated. During the period since COVID, we've had a number of false dawns from the period basically from June 2020 to November 2021. Scheduled traffic yo-yoed here. The COVID variants, I suppose the government COVID measures, and I suppose the lack of interest in supporting air travel during this period, the reluctance of consumers to travel during this period, all added up to what I found to be a very challenging period. But the key thing is we were open, we did provide a service, and yes, it was a big challenge. The airport has today resumed uh, with its scheduled traffic. Uh, numbers have been very low. Costs that we were incurring far exceeded any income. But the question really was about riding out this challenge to be in a better position once there was recovery. Despite our reliance over the period on our traffic mixes, the lifeblood of any airport is scheduled traffic. And like other airports in the state, we have thankfully had a huge reliance on two key airline customers, Ryanair and Aer Lingus. This spring, we've seen the resumption of scheduled traffic within the airport, where we're now serving 26 destinations. Thankfully, the resumption of transatlantic services with both Aer Lingus and United. And life is slowly returning to normal, whatever normal means now into the future. To get these carriers back onto our routes, we've had to incentivize the resumption of these services. On each of the last two years, we only served 380,000 passengers. This year, we hope to grow this back to 1.3 million passengers. And we hope to see the return in, uh, to 2019 levels by possibly 2023, 2024. For me, COVID highlighted a number of things. One was the need for us to diversify our business to not rely on any one market segment. For an airport of our size, just to rely on scheduled traffic or transit traffic or business or traffic really isn't, has, is not enough. We need to introduce further revenue streams. We're quite lucky that in other airports, outside of our scheduled traffic, we have a significant maintenance repair overhaul activity at this airport. And it's something I believe that we need to develop further in the years to come. Uh, MRO activity, not alone is about the maintenance of aircraft, but somebody has to paint the aircraft, somebody has to service the aircraft, somebody has to do internal refurbishments. And one thing we've done as a group, taking on my colleagues in Shannon Commercial Properties, is, is developed an aviation cluster in this region, supporting many aspects of the industry. That, what that in turn gives us is other revenue streams that we can rely on, whether it's rental income from a hangar, than just aeronautical revenue. The airport business is a tough business. It's a 24 hours by seven, long and social hours. And unfortunately, a lot of people have left this industry through severance, lifestyle choice, but bringing with them a significant level of knowledge, expertise that is irreplaceable. From my point of view, the lesson I've learned in this, in this, in this case is, is there is the need now to develop and encourage the next generation of airport managers, aviation specialists, so there will be opportunities out there to be grasped by you in attendance or, or, or your colleagues. You know who your friends are in a crisis. And there's one thing we found out over the last two years uh, is who our friends are. And, and I must give acknowledge and support for our own staff here at the airport, not just Shannon Airport Authority staff, but all the stakeholders who really have suffered a lot of pain during this period, as have many other people in this industry. But now that we're back resuming, it's about the recovery. The other people to mention, it's often we don't often support our government, is the support we've had of our shareholder, the Department of Transport. Our inclusion in the regional airport support scheme has really enabled us to carry out critical capital projects that heretofore would not have been possible without their support. And the other financial support in terms of supporting the operation and traffic development really have been life-saving. So without them, it really would be a different landscape that I'd be talking about you today. Your team today is about innovation. I understand that. And over the last 80 years, really Shannon Airport from an aviation and an airport perspective has been a world leader in this regard. Historically, we're the world's first duty-free shop. We're the first airport to put an industrial state adjacent to an airport. And that is something that's been copied a lot by the Chinese in particular. We're the first airport in Europe to provide a US pre-clearance facility. 
We're the first airport in the world to provide US pre-clearance to business jets. We're the first airport to introduce the sensory room for those, those in our community where travel was not open to. And this level of innovation continues today. When you're such a dominant airport in Dublin, we're not able to compete on price or the extensive selection of routes that, that they serve. But what we can do is look to our other unique selling points, including customer service, stress-free travel, to win the hearts and minds of the consumer. For me, the question is, how do we encourage the passenger in Port Leash? Do you turn left for Dublin or do you turn right for Shannon? This has nothing to do with the current challenges faced by Dublin, but it's about how we as an airport can provide a better customer service, stress-free travel. In Shannon, we let you park outside the front door of the terminal building. There are minimal queues. There are spacious surroundings. We can get you from the curb to the gate within 15 minutes. And by the way, if you throw in pre-clearance, you can have that completed in 20 minutes, if you so wish. Mind you, we do try and put some obstacles in your way, including retail, food and beverage, because we need that revenue to survive. What you may not see or appreciate is the next level of innovation and the use that we have made it over, over recent months. Uh, we've made good use of a crisis. We've made good use of the support of the Department of Transport funding. We've introduced the latest cabin bag of screen technology, which removes the need to remove any liquids, gels, electronic goods from bags. It fastens up the passenger screening process. We're the only airport to operate security scanners. They used to be called body scanners. There's no metal archways required anymore. And all at the very most is a focused hand search in any area of concern. Again, it reduces processing times. And for us, it increases retail time. We're the only airport in the world to provide both EU and USA, secure, USA TSA security standards. This eliminates a full TSA security check post US pre-clearance. It's a huge financial saving for the airline and it's a time saving uh, for our passengers. Our next phase of development is we've had to change our whole baggage screening technology. We're now operating to standard three since the 1st of September, 2021. We've bought US technology in the terms of rapid scan uh, machines. This technology is able to accept both EU and TSA algorithms, which effectively means that a bag is screened to both US standards and EU standards. Once this is accepted, the bag, which is currently subject to TSA security check stateside on arrival, will be cleared in Shannon for any onward connections. The benefit to the airline carrier is connection times in hub airports like Newark, Boston, JFK is going to be much shorter. So to finish, if you haven't flown Shannon before, do give it a try. Compare our product to other airports and we would very much welcome your feedback. Thanks again to the aviation secure, uh, sorry, the Irish Aviation Students Association for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my email address is nile, N-I-A-L-L dot M-A-L-O-N-E-Y at shannonairport.ie. And if anyone has any questions, I would love to help them in their career path. As I said to you, I've been very fortunate to learn from some of the best operators in the business. And I'm quite happy to share my experience and my knowledge with those. So best wishes in your future careers and best wishes in the choice that you make along that journey. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Noel. A very interesting insight from someone who's there on the day-to-day -day for the operations. Our final winner for today's prizes um, through the Instagram competition have been contacted, so congratulations. And with that, our symposium comes to an end. As you've heard from all of our speakers today, aviation is not going anywhere. It is an evolving and exciting industry to get involved in. Its resilience through one of the toughest periods worldwide has driven organisations to innovate and keep pushing forward. For anyone thinking of entering the industry, studying the industry, or beginning their professional career in aviation, we hope that today showcased exactly why there are so many passionate individuals from all backgrounds who have made an exciting and enjoyable career through aviation. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media platforms and keep an eye out for our multiple events throughout the year, especially those in the Limerick and Dublin area. We have some very exciting news coming up that uh, you should keep an eye out for. Sign up now to our membership platform on www.iasa.aero. I would, all, I would like to thank all of our guest speakers today 
who shared their knowledge on the vast amount of topics that were covered. I thoroughly enjoyed it, so I know that all of you watching at home definitely enjoyed it too. I would once again like to thank our signature sponsors, DAE Capital, SMBC Aviation Capital, the ISTEP Foundation, Killick Aerospace, PwC, KPMG and EY. Our supported by sponsors, CAE, Six West and the Irish Aviation Authority. Our partners, Airbus, ITT, Airline Pilot Club, uh, European Aviation Wellness Committee, Simtech, AlphaTech, the National Flight Centre and our university partners, DCU, MTU and UCD Smurfit. And finally, I would like to thank VideoWorks for their help in, with streaming the event today. And from all of us here at IASA, I would like to wish you a good evening and a safe bank holiday weekend. Thank you.